meeting number 263 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on February 28th, 2019 at 10 a.m. in our offices at 101 Federal Street here in Boston. We will start with agenda item number two, approval of minutes. Commissioner Stebbins, I understand you have two sets of minutes for approval. Yes, good morning. Uh, colleagues, in front of you, you have the February 14th, 2019 public meeting minutes. I would move that those be approved, again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Do we have a second? Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, the next sentiments from the February 20th public meeting, they're extremely short, but I would also move for the approval of those minutes, again, subject to any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Do we have a second? Uh, I move to approve the minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I second. Further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? Unanimous vote. <clears throat> Agenda item three is an executive session. The commission will now go into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 for the purpose of discussing litigation strategy in the case of Stephen A. Wynn versus Karen Wells, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission when resorts at al given the posture of the case it is clear that a discussion of the common commissions excuse me strategy in an open public meeting would have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the commission the commission will reconvene in open session at the end of the executive session do i have a motion to go into executive session so moved second, second. Okay, I will take a roll call vote of the commission to go into executive session. Commission, Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. And the chair votes yes. Thank you. The commission is now in executive session. All members of the public and any staff members not involved in the matter to be discussed must leave the room. I'd ask that all live audio and video recording and live streaming be shut off and the doors to the room be closed. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're reconvening in public session. The commission received a briefing today on litigation strategy in the executive session in compliance with the open meeting law, which requires that any vote to be taken be listed on the meeting agenda. A vote was listed for the executive session. The vote was put on the agenda in the event that the commission needed to take some action based upon the briefing. The commission at this time today was not asked to take any action, so no vote is needed and no vote will be taken. So thank you. Thank you, everyone here. Thank you to those who are watching from afar. We thank you for your patience. The commission has just concluded an executive session and completed the necessary steps to finalize the re resolution related to the WIN litigation in Nevada. It is our expectation that the case will be formally dismissed in the coming days. After significant and thoughtful deliberation, the commission executed this action after receiving advice from our legal counsel and the necessary assurances from investigators that this commission will receive all material and substantive information required to make a fully informed decision. The step also brings to a close the uncertainty of prolonged litigation and allows this important process to now advance. We fully appreciate the public interest in this matter. The commission 
Myself and my fellow commissioners have asked Executive Director Bedrosian and team to prioritize the steps necessary to prepare the final agreement and related executive session minutes for public release as soon as possible. Given the fact that our deliberations entailed a significant amount of attorney-client privileged considerations, appropriate redactions should be expected. But we are committed to transparency and eager to share an understanding of our thorough and careful decision making. I would like to acknowledge the diligence of our investigators and legal counsel. We still have a lot of work left to do, but we are profoundly aware of the effort that has gone into this incredibly complex process. I would like to ask now Executive Director Bedrosian to provide a status for next steps and describe what we should expect for a timeline as we begin preparations for the adjudicatory hearing. All right. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good um, afternoon. So uh, given that preface, uh, once the litigation in Nevada is resolved, then the commission can move on to prepare for the actual adjudicatory hearing. And the first step's going to start next week. The Investigations and Enforcement Bureau will provide the commissioners with information on any new qualifiers at the Wynn Corporation, and then the IEB's investigative report will follow soon after that. This is a lot of information. It will take you time to review. Um, meanwhile, the legal department will work with both the investigations and Enforcement Bureau and the lawyers for Wynn Corporation to identify and schedule any pre-hearing issues that need to be resolved in front of the commission. We'd hope to get those scheduled in March. Once you as commissioners have had enough time to review all the information provided to you and to have heard any pretrial motions, again, if any, um, then we can have the adjudicatory hearing. Um, as a reminder, it will be on the first day of the hearing that the IEB's investigative report will be publicly released. The actual number of days the hearing will take is subject to pretrial discussions with both the uh, IEB and feedback from you all once you have reviewed the information in the report. Given all these variables, today I can't tell you exactly when the adjudicatory hearing will be, but we are definitely balancing a sense of urgency and the necessary time to prepare for this matter. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Bedrosian, you, um, you mentioned the, um, that once this um, litigation is uh, resolved, yes. uh, we've taken all of the steps necessary, as the chair mentioned in, in, in her statement, uh, towards that resolution. Um, can you speak a little bit towards that time frame any more than you already did? I, I think it's soon. I mean, I, we, in, in, in any um, legal situation, you got to get all the signatures of parties and do the appropriate court filings. And I anticipate our legal staff is working with all the parties to do that as soon as possible. But we're talking and, I, and I've, taken, I've taken the direction from the commission and the chair, right. which is once that is done, um, to uh, work on uh, making the appropriate redactions on the minutes and making those available as soon as possible. Right. So I think all of those, uh, all of that will be a, a, a very important part of the public uh, record as we as we move forward. Correct. And, and I, I assume by your statement that um, these things will be done simultaneously, meaning we will have access to qualifier information and shortly after that um, a report to read, digest, understand, as as you and the staff will be working toward the hearing, uh, pre-trial motions or uh, not tr trial, but uh, the, any any pre-hearing yeah, pre uh, right. motions. Yeah. Um, so that will be going on at the same time. That's right. Yeah, they, it's not sequential. They will all be happening at the same time. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, well, I, I just want to mention and echo some of the remarks uh, from the chair relative to the the eagerness, uh, you, you mentioned the word eager, and, and that's one that I would like to emphasize, that uh, this has been um, 
a process that had that has taken uh, quite a bit of time, more than we initially anticipated, but it was necessary. Um, and I also want to uh, add my uh, my thanks to all the work that legal counsel, outside counsel, and our staff has done uh, relative to this uh, to this effort, uh, because there's a lot of um, uh, very important issues at stake uh, and a big big um, interest from the public. But we need to move carefully, and we need to do it deliberately uh, in a deliberative way. Um, and, and I'm just very thankful for all the work that everybody has has done. Yeah. I agree. We we realize it's uh, it's been an awful lot of work, and uh, we know that we are anxious to to move forward with this. And and I can speak for staff. We are anxious to for you to have the the product of all, a lot of work that's gone yeah. into that. And we think uh, mm -hmm. it's important, but it's important to you know dot the i's and cross the t's. Right. Right. And we'll follow a lot of what we've done in the past, make the, as you mentioned, the report will become public as we begin the adjudicatory proceedings. And I think that's also a very important mind, milestone to, to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Correct. Thank you. So actually, that sort of completes my administrative update. One quick question. Can you just remind us how many suitability, individual suitability reports we're expecting? Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't want to be exact, but I think it's eight or nine. Okay. Qualifiers? Uh, qual Qualifiers. Yeah, yeah this is the, these would be the new either uh, board members or key executives. And we'll get them at the same time as the, uh, the overall report? No, you'll get those starting next week. You'll get okay. those, and the report will be soon thereafter. But we don't want to... We want to get right on this and use the, the, the best use of your time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. No, it's up to you. It's however you want to do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Quick um, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you all for your patience. I ask that you exercise continued patience because we do need to take a break. Um, we, uh, we have a, a good amount to hear in the next part of our meeting. We're looking forward to that part of the meeting, but we do need a break. So we ask that we be we take a 30-minute break. Yeah. That yep. sounds, that sounds, one, no, that's, yeah, so yes. 120. Perfect. Thank you. We'll reconvene at 120. Thank you. We're reconvening our public session. We want to thank everyone once again for your patience. Uh, we are going to be turning to item five, but we will have a change in the order of our agenda. I understand um, we have a scheduling issue for uh, folks at MGM, and we appreciate our friends at Plain Ridge Park Casino for accommodating that scheduling need. So MGM will be going first. Ombudsman John Ziemba, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, on the agenda today are several matters relating to Plain Ridge Park and MGM Springfield, including quarterly reports for the fourth quarter of 2018, ending on December 31st, 2018. Chair and Commissioners, we first turn to the MGM Springfield items on the agenda. Uh, here with us today are Mike Mathis, President of MGM Springfield, Seth Stratton, Vice President and General Counsel of MGM Springfield, Jason Randall, Director of Human Resources, and Talia Spera, Executive Director of Arena Operations. Uh, Mike may need to depart shortly um, after the quarterly report, and so Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager, will uh, move into his seat. Uh, following MGM Springfield's fourth quarter presentation, I'll briefly outline some approaching and current deadlines uh, relating to the construction and post-construction requirements, uh, including the residential unit uh, development requirement that has a March 1st deadline that I will explain. 
Uh, in regard to the quarterly report, although quarterly reports by their nature look back on the prior quarter, we have asked MGM Springfield to provide some more detail on a number of important items, uh, including but not limited to an update regarding the development of the so-called uh, residential units, uh, the, the status of the development of the Dave's furniture lot, uh, and plans for the armory and activation of the plaza. Uh, MGM Springfield will also focus on employment, which has been and will continue to be a special priority item uh, for commission staff and for the commission. I know that Director Crippen has been working to further refine uh, employment reporting. It's anticipated that all of our licensees will ultimately have a similar reporting format. However, the reporting uh, will need to consider the uniqueness of goals and commitments made by the licensees. Uh, this reporting will in all likelihood be part of the discussion no later than the next round of the quarterly reports. And with that, I turn it over to Mike and the team. Uh, thank you, Ombudsman and Madam Chair. Uh, nice to be officially before you for the first time. Welcome uh, to uh, the Commonwealth and the regulatory process that we're going to be going underway. Look forward to having you out at um, Springfield to tour the site. It's a very special uh, facility and a, and a special group of people that run it. But um, pleasure to be working with you and, and fellow commissioners. Glad to be back in front of you in the, in the new year. Uh, thank you all for helping to accommodate my schedule. Uh, I know this morning ran late, and I want to thank the Plain Ridge Park folks for also um, uh, assisting and rearranging their schedule. And I, I do have to make a flight, but I'm available for any Q&A. Um, this is the priority, so I, I can make anything work if things come up real time. So um, otherwise, I'll, I'll leave it to my team to, to um, handle any of the, the closing out items. So I um, want to start with our, uh, our, our gaming revenue. Uh, this is for Q4, uh, October, November, and December. And you'll see that we've settled in around um, the low 20 millions per, uh, per month. Uh, and then you can see the 25% uh, gaming tax that's derived from that. Uh, you know, I'll just tackle this, this head on. I think there's been some discussion and some press about where these numbers are landing in the context of some of our original projections. Uh, this is, these, these numbers are certainly um, you know, uh, lower than what we had hoped to, to see in, in our initial months. Um, but just for context, I think uh, one important aspect of this, and, and we have some history having opened our National Harbor facility you know, a little bit over a year and a half ago in terms of what our ramp up looks like and what it takes to get stabilized, I think uh, the Plain Ridge folks will tell you, and anybody in our industry will tell you that typically we look at a three-year stabilization period, and there is a natural ramp up to understand uh, what is working with the customer, what kind of promotions are they reacting to, what is the competition doing in reaction to your um, to your program, you know, how are holidays landing, how is weather landing, and over that period of time, you can you can get to sort of a stabilized. Um, Run rate. Um, the other, the other aspect I think context for these months is that, uh, particularly November, December, even going into January, within the season are typically the lower months. You can see a difference of between 15 and 20 percent, doing nothing else other than just the, the the outdoor weather and the seasonality between gaming revenue in this market. So. Uh, as excited and as well as we think we opened up to, you know, one of the things that you're seeing here is we opened up into the winter sort of low season. Um, that said, we are uh, aggressively uh, working on um, increasing these monthly numbers and we feel good about a lot of the programs that we're putting into place. Each week we, we um, gain thousands of new customers to our loyalty database and that's also part of the ramp up so that when we put promotions out there, we're putting it out there to a, more, a larger, more active uh, database. And we're starting to see the benefits of that even in February uh, and as we go into the, to the new season. So unless you have any questions, just wanted to, wanted to uh, give some context to some of these initial numbers. Great. Uh, this is our lottery report. I, um, one, I want to compliment the Plain Ridge folks. I looked at their quarterly report, and they, they produce a significant amount of lottery revenue. These are really strong numbers, and um, we're always looking to continue to grow our lottery numbers. Again, what you'll see here is, is, is some stabil stability, some consistency between the, uh, between the months 
Um, and I think this does not include some of the lottery tickets that we actually buy as part of our promotional package. This just comes out of the actual machines. So we're looking at different ways, given the popularity and success of the lottery in this market, to leverage it to cross market. Um, but certainly happy with these results, and I think we have the opportunity to grow them from, from this um, baseline. Uh, compliance, and, and this is something we've worked really um, earnestly with your staff on. Uh, you know, given and uh, everyone's well aware of the, the design of our facility, uh, it's a very porous design. I think we have 15 to 20 doors um, because we wanted to engage with Main Street, wanted to engage with our outdoor plaza. Um, the, the upside of that is we have a very porous site and we're able to allow uh, our customers to enjoy all the different amenities of our resort without driving them through the casino floor, which is a typical older casino model, which is to force people through the gaming experience if you want to get to the non-gaming uh, experience. As you know, our design uh, flipped that on its head and we have significant um, exposure to uh, to the entire perimeter. Um, the challenge of that, as well as our, our, our uh, non-gaming amenities of bowling and movie theaters, a lot of the holiday programming on the plaza. The flip side of that is that uh, we don't have a true checkpoint like some of the traditional facilities. And uh, there are many days I wish we built a checkpoint because we spent a lot of effort policing um, our, our floor to make sure that we don't have underage um, access on the floor and, and gaming on the floor. Um, but you'll see some stats uh, reflective of uh, where we're at with the first column is uh, minors that we've, um, we've intercepted on the gaming floor before they've gamed. And in some ways that, that, that experience is almost like a typical checkpoint. Um, and then the second column is, is minors that have actually been able to game. And most of those happen on our slot machines. Uh, because each aisle way is a really a doorway into the floor. Uh, to be clear, our goal is zero on both columns, but to be a realistic, I think the, the most important goal is obviously um, preventing minors from gaming, and that's something we work on very hard. Uh, you'll see the photo is, is um, one attempt, and we continue to sort of tweak the, the enforcement policy, but we've created this um, podium right at our main entrance off our self-parking um, garage area, and that's where we get about 90% of our traffic. And even the uh, even standing up this podium has, uh, over the last 30 days or last two or three weeks, um, based on the feedback from the, off uh, the security officers, has really been an improvement. I think people um, who pass by there, there was always an officer posted there, and there was signage, but I think the podium itself has created the sense of more formality and more of a checkpoint. So we have uh, more, more customers coming up to us, um, showing their IDs, getting a stamp, and um, it's those types of things that we want to continue to, to work on and, and test and control. So uh, one of the things that Seth Stratton helped me to put forth in this slide is really to put some of these numbers in the context of our visitation. Uh, those percentages are, percent, are, are percentages of our total visitation. We're averaging about 500,000 uh, uh, visitors per month. And each of these incidents in that context you can show um, how really de minimis some of these uh, incidents are. Again, our goal is zero, but uh, I think context is important. Question, um, President Mathis. Um, have any analysis been done on the month of December? I mean, those numbers are significantly higher. Yeah, I think uh, I'll let maybe Seth and I can tag team this. Uh, one of the things that we did in November into December is really stepped up our um, enforcement. We dedicated more officers to patrolling the floor, mm -hmm. and I think uh, you'll see the the uh, the gaming numbers slightly higher than the prior month. But I think the the finding the miners on the floor is really a reflection of our stepped up enforcement and dedicating more officers to that. We we did a dedicated uh, patrol because one of the one of the issues we ran into from a customer service standpoint was that uh, you know our policy is to is to card anyone that looks under thirty. And you, you get some of these baby-faced 40-year-olds, and they were literally getting harassed on our casino floor because I would stop them. Seth would stop them. Our security officers would stop them. Um, some would ask for a stamp. Some wouldn't. So one of the things we implemented was in our peak period between 6 p.m. and 2 a.m., we've got a dedicated officer that patrols the floor. And the benefit of that is they can recognize someone that they've just carded and not have to ask them again for their ID. And that's been a really great customer service um, 
um, improvement, but some of that December is, is stepped up enforcement. Okay. Also, family programming. We did a, a tree lighting, uh, ice skating rink, and we just had more families um, that were going through the facility. And if they stepped into the, the floor, um, you know, that constituted uh, being in the gaming area, even if they didn't actually intend to game. Okay. Mike, you mentioned stamping. Uh, stamping them, uh, it's uh, one of those, like, in, at, at the clubs, you, uh, something that you cannot erase in your hand. What, what is... Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's right, Commissioner. And we, um, it is, we change them out. So we have a number of them. So you can't, you know, figure out what the stamp is and replicate it. So every day there's a different stamp and the security mm -hmm. officers, I think we have a right. total of about 14 or 16 that we rotate through. Okay. Um, but yeah, so that they don't, once they've been carded, they can show the, the hand stamp we recognize and we don't have to ask them again. Right. And is there, um, through your dealers, because then moving into the next column, um, when you identify them um, gaming, you said that's mostly in the slot, slot machines. machines. Yeah. Because there is that, the dealers presumably have um, at least an added level of potential review there. If they see the stamp or they see somebody who looks under 30 and ask them for their ID. Yeah, that's right. I, I think. Uh, we have a view that of, of zero tolerance on table games because there really is no excuse with that human interaction. We've had a, a, a handful of those incidents where either the dealer presumed that the cocktail server served them um, or, or checked their ID or vice versa. Um, we actually had a dealer who thought the, the requirement was 18 years old and did card them and, and thought they were compliant. Each of those instances have been dealt with in terms of progressive discipline because we, we view ze there should be a zero tolerance um, at the table games. The slot machines are, are areas where they can sort of sneak on, and, it, and I'm proud of how quickly the team has been finding those folks. Mm -hmm. but, um, but very rare to happen on table games, and when it happens, it's dealt with very seriously on our end. And in fairness, um, I think Rhode Island has an age limit of 18, so one of those... Um, things we learned through PPC was people were just so close, assumed at least early on that Massachusetts would be 18 and not 20, 21. Um, and there was, so there was a fair amount of educating of the public that also went, was part of that initial effort. No, I think that's a great point. I think and because we've recruited some of our, our staff from other uh, jurisdictions that, that there could be some confusion on that ground. But mm -hmm. we've done so much training around 21 and, and anyone appearing under 30 that even there we didn't, we didn't give much tolerance to, to anyone that would, that's confused about what the rule is in Springfield. And if I could <clears throat> just add, um, to be clear, uh, we are working um, with uh, MGM Springfield in this issue. The IEB is met routinely. Um, we're working collaboratively, but we're still the regulator. And, you know, to the extent that um, there are, you know, we look at each situation and go over them, and there might be aggravating factors, um, you know, Mr. Mathis just mentioned if someone gets on a table, that's probably an aggravating factor because of the human interaction that should or shouldn't happen in that point. A slot machine on the edge of the floor might be different than one buried deep in the floor, um, but we're looking at all those factors. Someone drinking in addition to gaming, obviously, is another issue. So we're looking at all those factors, and we'll, we'll take those. And um, But we do recognize the poorest nature of the property on the flip side, we want to make sure that our licensee does everything they literally can do to prevent this, because this, mm -hmm. this is a serious issue for a lot of folks, including the commission and other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it off to Seth to give an update on our spending. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to cover our um, spending in Q4 of 2018. Uh, compared to our goals. And so there's a lot of information on these slides. I, I'm not going to talk through every point. I think it's represented graphically. But um, the, sh the short answer or the conclusion is that um, we're making good progress towards our goals. Um, we're not quite there on several of them. Um, we're doing very well with the uh, veteran business enterprises. But um, with respect to uh, women-owned businesses and uh, minority-owned businesses, there continues to be um, work to be done, and we're working hard at it. Um, some of some of what you you see here is that we um, you know we front loaded a lot of um, purchasing through our OS and E for for opening, um, and a lot of that when you're opening and you need the high volume is with vendors that we've done business with previously um, through national relationships, and we're now as we're operational shifting um, some of those purchases 
from the initial buy to um, ongoing procurement um, on a local level. So I think you'll continue to see progress um, toward those goals. Um, but on the, from the Women Business Enterprise standpoint, we're at roughly 7%. Um, we're at 3% um, minority and 3.5% um, veteran. And then shifting to the right, um, and I want to distinguish, by the way, between you'll see two different totals, the left and the right, with respect to the spend. The 13.5 million is our biddable spend, and that's and our goals for uh, veteran minority and women-owned business spend are focused on um, biddable spend because um, that's those are some of the purchases that that um, we have the ability to go out to the community, and they're less specialized. And so when we set those goals, we characterize it on our biddable spend. Um, some examples, by the way, are, are you know regular purchases of uh, supplies and equipment rentals, um, services, advertising, those are generally all biddable. Um, there's some non-biddable spend, um, which you'll, we factor in to our total spend for our local commitments. And that includes, on top of our biddable spend, things like gaming equipment, for instance, would be um, uh, not part of our biddable spend. It'd be hard to go out to the community for gaming equipment. Um, uh, employment benefits, um, such as, um, you know, um, health insurance, et cetera, uh, national travel agents, things that um, are enterprise-wide um, procurement that we generally buy at a, at a corporate level. So um, we, um, $18.5 million spent in um, Q4, and you'll see the breakdown of um, the, the local, um, both Springfield, surrounding community. Um, so Springfield is the, um, uh, sorry, Springfield is the, um, gray, 19.85%. Um, Western Mass is 24.5%. Um, and then you'll see um, we also break down um, the percent of the surrounding community, so um, the community is right around us. Go ahead. Um, did I hear you say that you've already started to make some adjustments in order to be more inclusive with your... Um, with your uh, biddable spend? In other words, you realize that you are not meeting your goals and you have made adjustments? That's right. Um, I think a good example would be um, probably in the food and beverage area. You know, as we're buying and getting ready for opening, we're, we're procuring a lot of um, um, food and beverage and related uh, supplies um, at a high volume um, level with mm -hmm. respect to opening. But as we're operating in the community and finding those local purveyors, we're able to shift some of that to, to local purveyors, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we've been making those, um, we've been making those changes and we anticipate those blue bars um, go, continue to go up and get as close to, and, and hopefully in some instances exceed the orange bars as we move forward. Okay, thanks. Um, can I also just ask a question perhaps of John or, or um, Jill or Joe uh, behind, behind Seth? Um, I recall a process internally for um, for us to review during the construction uh, period. Um, they were, I don't know if this is the right word, but exempt certain categories um, from what would be the base to determine the MBE and the WBE because of things like you know uh, equipment that only one company makes, and it's unrealistic to make that um, part of the base. Uh, and, and so on. Have we done a review of that for MGM to look at this difference between what they're calling biddable and um, you know the actual total um, to be comfortable that you know in fact the categories that they're saying um, you know should not be part of that base um, should not or is this something that we could do uh, in the future? Matter. Some of the general categories that um, uh, were mentioned by MGM Springfield, I think, are um, categories that we have um, approved um, early on with um, Plain Ridge Park Casino, so I don't see anything um, out of the ordinary there. But I, I do think as time goes on, we'll um, take a look at uh, some of the spend and 
um, uh, but it traditionally spend that is um, part of a national contract or airline or, or things that can't be bid um, are, are things that we have um, accepted as outside that area. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I'm, I was just asking if we're, you know, if we're reviewing these numbers as we go forward, and it sounds like we will. Yeah, we will be. Okay. Thank you. Hey, commissioners, I'll just add, you know, we are, we're part of a, a vendor uh, advisory group locally. Yeah. Uh, our head of procurement meets with um, local stakeholders, and I know there's a high comfort level that, although we may be missing some of these numbers, it's not through a lack of effort. We've, we've tried to reach out to many different vendors. We do it um, all the time. In fact, we've taken a chance on a few local vendors, and frankly, the product didn't stand up, and, and we're willing to take that um, chance as much as we can. So uh, we're happy to take any referrals. I, I feel comfortable that if you talk to any of the stakeholders, you know, we're doing what we can on, on each of these categories. But if there's some vendor that believes that they haven't had a, a shot at us, please know that we'll, we'll take a look at anybody because this is an important part of our, uh, our program. Mm -hmm. Hey, Michael, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and Ryan and his team have been great to work with. And I know Jill continues to work with them. I think where we may also want to look at is folks that you're already doing business with who are not going through a certification process. You may have some vendors in that you know, file that may think they're certified, may have a certified we don't recognize, but I think to kind of go back and revisit that, that might be also uh, an occasion to, to strengthen some of your numbers. Some of you just kind of says, well, I told you I was a veteran-owned business, but until we have the certification, until you guys are aware of the certification, it's tough to kind of count those numbers. But um, we've enjoyed the chance to work with, with Ryan and his team, and he seems, I don't want to say desperate, but he's anxious to kind of keep working with us and some of our other stakeholders are at those vendor advisory team meetings. So, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next slide that I'll cover very briefly is the is the trend slide, and it's it. Um, I think we're early to really see um, trends, um, but let me just walk through with you just to be clear what each one of these columns represents, because we'll be coming back um, each quarter um, on these, and I think quarter by quarter we'll able to establish more more clear trends. But um, the first bar is our pre-opening spend. So basically, the few years that leading up to opening. Um, that's the percentage for each of these um, categories. And then you'll see the, the largest bar in each graph is that OS and E spend. So that was that bulk purchasing leading up to opening, and that's why those, those bars are so much higher. Uh, the next bar is basically since we opened. So um, from August 23rd uh, to the end of um, the, end of the year, um, that represents uh, the percentages for each category. And then the final bar is just the quarter that we're focused on for this quarterly report. So you'll see that the operating and the Q4 are very similar. The os &E is going to be um, a lot larger. And then the, the pre-opening generally smaller. But we hope that, um, you know, that the operating bar is going to get, again, grow close to those goals. And the quarters may vary from time to time, to time depending on what we're purchasing. But hopefully that, that operating to date and the goal will, will continue to trend very close to one another. So remind me, the os &E stands for Owner Supplied Equipment? O operating Supplies and Equipment. O operating operating supplies. supplies and Equipment, yeah. okay. So they're expendable. So in other words, they're not, they don't have a long useful life. It's stuff that you will, as you use, you'll continue to have to replenish? Yeah, so a good example is, um, I don't know if it's a good example, but an example would be um, flatware and plates. We bought, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of glasses and plates to open up. Now some of those will break, um, so we'll change them out. And so we replenish, and we're always looking for opportunities to find, say, local or diverse vendors that can help replenish those. Same things with, you know, hotel supplies, um, um, various things that we had to buy in bulk early on, and then as we replenish, um, as they their useful wear um, reduces or there's breakage, we'll we'll look for opportunities. Thank you. You know, there's a there's another, and Mike, you touched on it, talking about you know finding um, uh, youth on the gaming floor and the unique nature of your facility. I know we're going to hear about what you have planned for the plaza. You might have a unique story to tell in terms of 
engaging minority women in veteran owned businesses for the types of farmers markets and other you know festivals you have going on as you program the plaza it doesn't necessarily reflect spend that you have but you're giving them an incredible business opportunity again i don't want to throw another layer of data for you to collect but i think it's might be helpful data to share about your story and again the uniqueness of the facility yeah we're not cutting them a check directly but we're giving them an opportunity to be in front of our clients in front of our patrons our m life members and obviously that's you know again an added economic benefit to think about absolutely so this this next slide just shows uh, similarly shows the trends in each one of the categories of local spend so um, you know starting with the most narrow in the far lower right hand corner Springfield then um, going out to surrounding communities and then Western Mass and then the Commonwealth um, I did I said on the last slide it's too early to to see trends but um, maybe I'll I'll say hopefully we're seeing a good trend already on this one which is in I think every instance um, yes definitely in every instance Q4 is represents an increase over um, opening to date so I think that's a good sign that we're what I was talking about before is we're finding at, as each month goes by more and more opportunities for local purchasing um, so that that the the latter three months the last three months of 2018 we were doing better than we were over the last five in total so um, and, and that's universal in each category so I think that's um, the, the good start of a trend and how some of the ways we do that is through um, our vendor outreach, outreach events and this and we'll report quarterly on the various events we're involved in but you'll see here listed some of the the events that Ryan and his team uh, participate in um, uh, throughout the year but these are some of the specific, specific events that um, they've attended uh, in in Q4 and you'll see that we're not you know we're, we're reaching out um, throughout the Commonwealth and even beyond borders to find um, to find uh, opportunities specifically with um, veterans and, and minority suppliers um, you know we're going outside of the Commonwealth to really find um, opportunities to to engage this is one of my um, favorite slides because this um, this is a few just shows a few examples of some of the businesses that we've we've partnered with um, and you'll see on here um, quotes that that they have provided to us um, but I'll I'll highlight um, a few sentences from these quotes because I think it shows um, basically the opportunity the economic development opportunity um, Mansfield paper talks about um, being able to address wage adjustments and benefits to keep competitive and ahead of industry standards um, Wasman AV um, said that the MGM project forced them to re-examine their internal processes and make much needed changes that allow for future and continued growth and market expansion uh, and and park cleaner is one of my favorite stories because um, they were my uh, dry cleaner and I recommended that um, that they talk to our, our um, hotel VP and it worked out being a very good uh, partnership they're a women-owned business uh, in the city of Springfield and they've uh, added 12 employees uh, already uh, as a result of mm. partnering with us and doing our, our uniform dry cleaning so um, that's a really good story um, so I think it, collectively you see from these three snapshots that folks are expanding and changing their business models and um, le learning to grow and develop as a result of their partnership with us and we we think that'll present further opportunities and good lessons learned that they can share with other uh, local businesses um, as as we continue to partner and, uh, I'll pass the baton to Jason to talk about employment thanks Seth. Uh, thanks Seth. I um, want to share uh, a few slides on our employment here so our first slide shows our progress on our hiring goals uh, with Springfield residents uh, employees our goal being 35% uh, we currently stand as a 1231 at 38.4% uh, of our employees that are Springfield residents. Uh, for uh, women employees, we're at 45.3% with our goal being 50%. So that is certainly a goal that we recognize there's still work to be done uh, by our recruitment and, and staffing team to, to onboard. Um, anecdotally, we, we've identified a, a, a couple department areas where we do have uh, additional opportunity like security officers 
that may be a, a traditional male dominated role where we can partner more with our uh, local universities and schools to um, you know, recruit female students coming out of those programs to join our team. Uh, for minorities, uh, again, 50% goal, we're at 56.3% of our employees um, are minorities. And on the veteran side, with 2% being our goal, we stand at 6% um, of active employees on, on 1231. Um, this is representative of 2,522 employees that were active with us on 1231. Uh, Jason, you're missing a, it'd be great if you had a figure up there of what you're doing from the region. You had a goal of 90% from the region. Okay. So, On the next slide, I'll transition to that because I do have some more um, kind of breakdown of data that we can share that's not in a uh, nice pie graph chart for us right. here. Um, but we, we do break down on the top section. Um, the employees are broken down full-time and part-time. Um, with out of the 25, 22, 77.5% of the employees are full-time employees um, in 22 0.5% uh, being part-time employees, and uh, our goal being an 80-20 split on, on those areas. Um, as we work down the, the graph on the lower section, um, we do showcase Western Mass residency and Massachusetts residency as a total um, of the employee base as well. So 73.5% of our employee base represent Western Massachusetts uh, residents with 75.6% total being Massachusetts residents. Quick question, are you um, in Plain Ridge will know because I've asked them the same questions in the past. Um, it's great that you're tracking percentages, but it's really important to track where folks are in the organization. Now I know when you opened in this company you were extremely diverse, top to bottom, but I think it's really important to continue to track that and um, you know if there, it's, it's important to, to not only track it but probably report it to us as well. So if you see some, if you don't track it, sometimes you don't realize that there's an issue in a certain mid-level management or whatever it may be with women and minorities, veterans. So um, I, I, I see all these numbers, percentages, but it, it's nice to really keep track of um, how they're doing moving up in the company. And I know at the beginning you had a great story to tell about that. So if I could jump in, Commissioner, it's a very... It's a fair question. It's a dialogue we've already been having uh, with staff. I, I think uh, John touched on it earlier, and uh, we've been speaking with Jill as well on what the reporting like, the public reporting looks like going forward. We have really rich data. We have a lot of information yeah. internally, right. and we do look at a lot of different trends um, internally on, on, on where various folks are, and we have some pretty rich data, so we, it, um, we're, we continue to discuss um, what that looks like going forward in terms of our reporting um, in, in this context and otherwise, but um, we the point is taken and we we do um, and Jason could um, verify this, but we have a lot of really rich data on uh, internally on what Great. what our employees where they are where they're from um, salaries you know based on grade etc. So the rich. The rich data you're talking about, it sounds like it's something you're proud of, right? It, it's, it's, it's a tool that we definitely, um, it's a tool that we use all, all the time. It's just um, how much as a, what the dialogue we're having now is how much as a private company we're putting out there for the world to see and everyone, you know, the, the more granular it becomes, the more, um, we use it on a granular basis, but we are sensitive to, having that granularity out in the public. No, realm. we're not interested in you publicly reporting this specific, you know, but just overall how you're doing top to bottom, I think, is is an important piece if we're looking at uh, employment numbers. Understood. Mm -hmm. We agree. I, I would I would echo that. I, I, want to, uh, I want to jump in. I actually have two points. First of all, um, just curiously going to your website this morning, 30, 30 some odd positions that you're still posting for. Is that 30 a hard number? You're looking for multiple people under a number of those. I mean, let's stress the word that people should not have worried. I didn't have a job on day one. There are still opportunities to come and work for MGM Springfield and, you know, put myself on a career path. So those 30 positions, combination of full-time and part-time, 
Correct, and there some of the positions are representative of multiple headcount um, for for looking for more numbers. I, I think anecdotally, it's about sixty headcount out of those thirty positions. So okay. some of them are one to pure one to one okay. uh, seats, but some of them do represent, in some cases, five or ten um, people that we're actively looking to to source in. Okay. Um, other information that I would like to see, and I'll go back to what Commissioner Cameron was talking about in a second, but. Uh, and again, this stresses the uniqueness of your campus, the uniqueness of your facility. You have other vendors, other tenants on site. I think it's important to get their body count. Maybe not necessarily the breakdown, if that becomes a challenge, but what is the overall body count? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of things that were rolled out in your RFA2 was an assumption that you guys were going to operate a number of these amenities. That's not the case, but there's still people coming to work every day on your property, you know, be it the cinema, Kringle Candle, you know, Hanush, any any of those other entities. I think it's in, hopefully at some point you're going to have Wahlburgers on the corner. That'll be exponentially more employees. So looking at overall employment count, even if they're not yours, if there's a way to extract that with your with your your tenants, I think that'd be great information to, to share. Um, you know, to pick up on Commissioner Cameron's point, um, I think there's a lot more detail. We've talked about it. You know, we do want to get into uh, kind of what that diversity is at various levels and management employment levels within the company. I understand that it might be a snapshot in time, but at the same time, you guys might be able to show, I think to your point, folks moving up within, you know, the organization. That was one of the things that impressed me about my trip to Detroit, to MGM Detroit, was finding a person who started as a banquet server who was now in banquet sales and you guys have a good track record or a good human resource development plan when it comes to helping folks move up the ladder so um, I would suggest that uh, it, would, it shouldn't wait until your next quarterly meeting if the executive director and maybe a member of the compliance committee and staff sit down with you and try to hash out this new reporting format some of it's going to be consistent with all of our licensees, you guys are going to have obviously some uh, information that we need to make sure that you're in compliance, as John mentioned, with what your local goals were. So um, if we can do that in the immediate future, that'd be a, a good use of all of our time. Uh, Commissioner, I, if, if I can just address a couple of those comments, and they're all um, well taken. I think you're absolutely right. And if you didn't ask it, I would have volunteered it. So. You know, the, the important part of the asterisk is that that number of 25, 22 does not include our uh, tenants and our vendors. And as you know, we, we take a campus-wide approach in terms of the economic um, development we generate in terms of the workforce development we generate. So we believe we have approximately 250 employees that are uh, tenant employees. We know that because we have to badge them. Uh, so you can add approximately 250 to that number. And that also does not include vendors. I know I've been in meetings with our team where we specifically um, made a decision to hold off on um, a hire because we wanted to continue using a, a local business for outdoor cleaning, for example. So there are, there are a number of jobs created on the, on the campus by outside services that easily could have been our employees, but for various reasons we thought it was the right decision to use, our, um, to use the outside service. Um, and this also does not include, we have, we had at any given time, about 100 employees in the pipeline through licensing and background checks as well, in addition to the open positions. So there's significant um, employment that is either in, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the pipeline or being uh, driven that's outside of our technical active hire list as a snapshot at any given time. Okay. Um, with respect to the granularity, uh, you're right to have the instinct that um, evasiveness is sometimes a desire uh, not to give you the information because the information isn't good. In this case, that's, that's not the issue. The issue is because we have so much data, we want to make sure that it makes sense and that it's reflective. Um, what is a supervisor? What is a manager? What are the right departments to look at? Some of our departments are so small that you can't drive some of the diversity goals that we might otherwise want to do, want to want to show you. So I think a, I think a, a session, a working session, makes a ton of sense. So you can see what we have, and then we can put ourselves in a position to um, to produce it in a way that that shows the good effort. But we also have to think about our other jurisdictions, and and we want to make sure we don't create inconsistent standards. 
um, um, cross jurisdictions. So happy to have that conversation with you. And yeah. I think the de and, and you've seen my executive team. You've yes. seen our workforce. Uh, we're we're proud of mm -hmm. the diversity throughout all our levels. Yeah, there's two, um, and I'm glad you mentioned, uh, Commissioner, the, the compliance group. There's two levels that are at, at play here. Uh, information, access to all the rich information um, that, that you described is, is key, and we've always had it, and our staff will continue to have it. Uh, but there's also the, the reporting that is that is important for not just for, for the rest of us outside of that group, but uh, the public, really. Um, and, and, and But the flip side is we also recognize that some of that granularity is indeed potentially a competitively uh, disadvantaged um, information if, you, if it was just put out there entirely. Uh, so there is a happy med medium that I think we can, um, you know, we can all um, agree on when it comes to uh, public reporting. So we should we should work on that. Excellent. Uh, next slide, we get into our uh, 29 workforce 2019 workforce development plan. Uh, many of these um, educational and community partner, partners you'll recognize from prior uh, presentations, but these are relationships that we continue to value and expand upon in 2019. Um, on the educational side, um, certainly Putnam Vocational uh, Technical School and Westfield Academy, uh, two uh, high school level programs that we're able to utilize uh, and partner with um, having our executive chefs come into their programs to uh, you know, continue reinforcing uh, skills and encouraging to continue in the field and uh, potentially advancing into like a Holyoke Community College and their culinary program as well. As well. Uh, the Massachusetts Casino Careers Training Institute continues to be a valuable partner of ours. They join us on many of our recruiting trips to um, share their, their experience as well, but we continue to recruit students at completion of their, of their classes as well. Um, UMass Amherst remains a core uh, school to, to MGM resorts in its entirety, and uh, specifically us here in Springfield. Um, we're on campus uh, at least once or twice a semester at recruiting events, and additionally into uh, their hospitality class classrooms to do uh, guest lectures um, as requested. Um, we're able to continue promoting our internship programs at um, STCC, American International, uh, Western New England, and then Johnson and Wales, uh, we, we participate in their uh, large annual um, culinary job fair for recruitment. Mm -hmm. on, the, our work, on the following slide, our workforce development partners, um, uh, Westfield Job Corps um, w was a fantastic partner leading up to opening, and uh, we continue to have very active dialogue on how uh, students that are uh, actively participating in their programs can work simultaneously on our property, um, as well as New England farm workers um, um, bringing their members uh, into us. They, the pre-opening had a large uh, number of their members that were able to participate in the MCCTI training school, um, and additionally uh, that joined our culinary program, and we continue to partner with them on our recruitment efforts. Um, uh, we participate in uh, a virtual job fair with AARP, um, and as well as attending uh, veteran, Veterans Inc.'s uh, job fairs that they host locally as well. Um, uh, uh, Goodwill of Hartford, they put on a, a large in, uh, job fair that we attend annually, um, and we've been fortunate to uh, share a lot of our recruitment efforts uh, with the Urban League um, via their uh, radio program that, that they have in Springfield. Um, we do uh, continue to reach out to um, Head Start and, and um, be able to promote our positions to uh, the parents of their, their, their customers. Um, Veterans Assembled Electronics had a very strong, has a very strong partnership um, on our slot technicians. Uh, they have a training programs specifically designed, uh, so we're able to recruit um, individuals right out of that program. Um, United Way, um, if you recall the stories pre-opening um, the um, victims of the hurricane tragedy that, uh, in Puerto Rico that relocated to our, our area, United Way was able to organize us to reach out to those, um, those, individ those impacted individuals to recruit. Uh, ultimately, we have had hiring success in having those individuals come on our campus and, and be able to grow their careers with us while, while their families transition here. Um, Dress for Success, we, we've been able to provide a uh, speaker to their students, conduct mock interviews um, uh, to their participants as well. And then um, our partnership continues to grow with Springfield Works um, you know, in their um, you know, citywide efforts of um, aligning and, 
and organizing uh, additional training and, and employment opportunities for, for, for the region. Um, the final slide that I'll share um, is our Q4 recruitment efforts. Um, on the heels of opening, our team was still able to get out to, to more job fairs um, to, to share our message. Um, specifically, um, we attended a, a veterans picnic in the park that was hosted by the Eastern Hamden County Veterans Service District. Um, uh, Mass Hire put on a, a large Keeping Western Mass Working Job Expo that we're um, happy to, to be at that and continue to, they held one in January as well, that we're, we're happy to be at that as well. Um, Western Mass Employment uh, Collaborative held their job expo um, that, that we were in attendance at. Uh, Western New England had a large career fair in Q4 that we, we were able to attend. Um, Veterans Inc., their flagship uh, career fair that they host in Holyoke. Um, I believe those are second one. We've been uh, proud to be at that one both times. And then with UMass Amherst, um, with their hospitality program, they hosted a rapid recruitment session. Uh, where they only invited in 15 employers. We were one of those employers, and uh, we really did speed dating with students to share um, you know, what opportunities lie within, within our company. Great. Any questions before I pass back to uh, Seth and on to Talia here? Mike. Mike. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on the, our marketing highlights and then hand it off to Talia for the entertainment discussion. So. Uh, this, what you have before you is, is um, a sample of um, examples of our monthly newsletter. And this is really our, our promotional casino promotional calendar. Uh, it's been very successful. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, some, some of our projections are not quite where we want them to be. Um, to get more granular, our table games is very successful. Our slots is what's um, ramping slower than we had hoped. And we continue to, to uh, tweak our promotional model. Card giveaways have proven to be very successful. In, in March, um, we are giving away, we have, the, uh, in, we have the fortune of five Saturdays in March. So we're giving away five cars on five Saturdays. So it's going to be um, exciting to see that promotion. But um, we've had a lot of success on card giveaways. So just to give you a sample of the kinds of things that we do in our monthly newsletters. Uh, briefly talking about sponsorships and, and partnerships, extremely important for us is who we uh, associate ourselves with and the inherent goodwill and uh, cross-marketing that comes with it. And you can see we have the marquee brands really throughout the Commonwealth represented on the slide. Uh, some, of our, some of our most successful weekends have been when we've got a sold-out Thunderbirds game, when we've got... Um, when we've got a great uh, Red Sox playoff game, uh, certainly the Patriots success um, has, has, has been a boon to the property. Um, Six Flags in our backyard is part of our summer programming. So uh, really associating ourselves with those brands, understanding their promotions, understanding their database so that we can do cross-marketing uh, is a big part of how we continue to ramp but they've been very successful and we plan on continuing them. Um, you've heard me talk about the Basketball Hall of Fame relationship before, and one of the shames uh, before we came to town was much of the activation with the Basketball Hall of Fame's annual uh, induction ceremony went down to Connecticut where they, where they held a party after holding the ceremony. Um, we're now able to hold a lot of those ancillary events and keep uh, a lot of that great activity in downtown Springfield. That's great. So just a small example of what we're able to do now that we've got a facility. Will they, will they come to your facility next year? Uh, we've reluctantly agreed to share it with uh, with our competitor okay. um, because they've they made a substantial investment in the in the Hall of Fame, but we're able to to share Good. much of the activity. Um, we've got them sort of Thursday and Friday. I think they get them Saturday. Okay, we'll try to get them back Sunday. Um, so that's a little bit of the tug of war that's going on with our competitors. Okay, Mike, um, this was in the prior slide, and of course I could not participate. But how does one win a a car? I'm just curious. How does one win a car? How does one win a car? Yeah, it's a um, it, it's based on the uh, amount of play, and you get entries. Um, we do a virtual um, raffle. Uh, yeah, what do you call it? The old um, sweepstake. Yeah, I'm gonna make a hand motion, like a little, <laughs> little a oh, drum. We do a promotional, yeah. a virtual promotional drum, and okay. the more you play, the more more tickets you get into the virtual drum, oh. and then it's just a random number generator that kicks it out. So we'll get ten, we'll get ten finalists. Um, that are able to pick um, five to ten finalists on any given day. They're able to pick envelopes, and one of the envelopes is the key to the car. And I always go to those because they're exciting. And the other nine are um, consolation prizes, are, are free play, and other other rewards. 
So okay. the shrieks that come out when, when they open up the envelope for the car is pretty pretty great. That's great. Right. You should make sure it's you can't play and maybe your extended family can't play. Either. <laughs> Nobody can hear. That's right. And then uh, lastly is, actually I got two more slides, uh, just some images from how we've activated uh, these partnerships. So we had a um, MGM Springfield day out at, as a tailgate at one of the Patriots games. In fact, the first one was so su successful, um, and I think they felt badly that we got rained out the first time, that they invited us back the second time. So great opportunity to get in front of customers, particularly on the eastern part of the state, um, drive MLife signups. Uh, we do a food truck. Um, you can see on the bottom right, we have a Mexican food truck called Guac This Way, uh, which is really popular, mm. and it's, um, it's a lot of fun. So we're able to get in front of uh, new customers and, and cross-market. And then other examples of what we do at Thunderbirds and, and some of the other programs. And then the last one is, is just to remind you of, of uh, what we do with our MLife rewards. We have a huge database, which is our MLife database, and through it, we're able to take partners and, and the win-win is we're able to give uh, promotional discounts um, from our vendors and partners to our database. So it drives value to our customers. It also drives awareness to our, our partners. So 10% off merchandise for the Thunderbirds, um, other discounts for some of our other sports partners, uh, Basketball Ho Hall of Fame, 15% off admission. So it's a great way to, uh, to expose those brands to an active, our active database. Great been really successful and we'll do more of that. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Talia. Um, I'm unfortunately have to run for my flight and this is one of my favorite sections which is entertainment. Um, but uh, some exciting announcements that we've just made and I do have time if there's any any other questions that you feel like you want to ask of me before I hand it off to the team. Mr. Mathis, I have one question back on the um, parachute slide. I'm sorry. I'll get used to that. Um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mathis, I have one question, and it's, I'm sorry that I didn't ask it before. It's out of order, and I want to make sure you get your plate. But with respect to the issue around um, the minors, yeah. you had said that you, you know, the, the number was obviously higher, and I understand it's because you have higher enforcement measures. Do you happen to know, I know it's not fair because it's your quarterly report, um, but do you happen to know how January looked for the min uh, minor number? I think we could fish it. Seth, you want to help with that? Uh, I don't have the specific numbers, but it looks um, very similar um, to December. Uh, I think the uh, I think there are anecdotally, I think there are a couple fewer gaming, but more that we intercepted on the floor. So it's a very similar month to December. I think some of the same factors that led to the higher numbers in December contributed in January as well. Um, some of the family events, the cold weather. Uh, the increased enforcement. So what we're, what we've really been, w one of the things that, and I think Mike did a little bit of analysis, but one of the things we did see a really promising change in January. By the way, each one of these instances we have a report on, and we look at the time. Yeah. We track the person, see mm -hmm. where they came in, how long they were gaming, and so what you're seeing a good positive trend is it's taking less time for us to find them and remove them, and so the average time in January is much lower than, than. Um, it was earlier on, and so um, you'll see that um, when we get into the details. But Mike, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I, I think you know one of the things, and I think you're you're right on, is what we're looking for is was the trajectory right. of our of our program and our enforcement. And one of the things I was really pleased to see in January is, and um, I did some math on the right out here, is um, 20, uh, 25 percent of the incidents of um, gaming incidents. Um, were discovered uh, five minutes or less, um, and those are largely slot machines. So that's a that really speaks to the ability of our uh, our security team to sweep the floor and to aggressively um, check new uh, new new faces that look like they might be underage. Seventy five percent of the incidents were uh, twenty minutes or less. So from the early days where someone could hide out in the corner, and now we've implemented these programs, we're able to get to them sooner. Um, to me, that's the measure of of how effective our team is. Um, we're going to continue to do things like the podium and 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 in increase sweeps, but really we're looking we're looking for those those durations. If they sneak on there, they're not going to be on there for long. Mm -hmm. And we'll share those new numbers with you. But I think they have been pretty consistent. It's just the durations that have really come down, which is um, which is a great success. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks have so much. A, have Thanks a for safe flight. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you.
Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm excited to talk about some of our entertainment programming over Q4. Um, so first, I'll speak to the headliners uh, that we had, which are the national acts. So at Mass Mutual Center, we had Stevie Wonder, Bill Burr, and then the Comedy Get Down Tour, which featured some of the artists that you see at the bottom. And at Symphony Hall, we had Aaron Lewis, um, Felipe Esparza, who is a comedian, and then a partnership with our Springfield Symphony Orchestra, actually, for a Symphonic Prince um, tribute show. And then on the plaza, we were excited to bring Blue Man Group, Jabberwockies, Street Drum Corps, and a sold-out show of the Dropkick Murphys. And Dropkick Murphys um, was a fun event for me specifically. Uh, we, in partnership um, with Nathan Bills, which is a local restaurant, where, and the artists themselves, were able to generate over 16000 um, wow. for charity. And that went to Sergeant, uh, Gunnery Sergeant Tom Sullivan Foundation, which is a, a local... Um, deceased military veteran that we have in the area. So um, one of my favorite shows that we did so far. These uh, these 10 shows um, we're estimating brought around 25,000 visitors to downtown Springfield over Q4. Mm -hmm. Some of our community events and programming, most of which were on the plaza uh, and within the armory. And so uh, Jam Fest, which was a uh, free music fest to the community in partnership with the Springfield um, Business Improvement District and brought around 4,000 visitors, um, Ride to Remember. We had a cornhole tournament, um, and so I won't touch on all of them. Um, some of you had attended our free concert series as well, which was called City Block at the time. We've got some images of, of what that programming looked like. You see the tree lighting. You see Nancy Kerrigan opening our ice rink. Um, some of the Ride to Remember participants and other activities that we had. And as far as upcoming entertainment, um, for the headliners specifically, um, we're really excited to uh, have a sold-out share show. She's going to be performing at the Mass Mutual Center in April. And then this week, we just announced our one-year anniversary programming. Uh, we'll be bringing Aerosmith to the Mass Mutual Center for four dates uh, with expected attendance of 22,000 over the week um, to the downtown Springfield area. We're not even on sale to the public yet. Um, we're just in the pre-sale phase right now. and We've already sold 50% of our sellable capacity. So that show will go quickly, and it's going to be really exciting for the downtown area. 50% of all four shows? Correct. So we have 21,000 um, right. in total sellable capacity. As of noon today, we were at 10,500. In, in the comedy club? Yes. So the comedy club is, uh, we call it Roar. It's yes. currently in the armory. Right. Um, we've had about four shows a weekend starting since January. Right. That was a, a temporary agreement with a partner out of Boston, John Tobin Presents. It was supposed to be six months. Um, we've verbally agreed to extend that throughout the remainder of the year, and so we'll continue to have comedy in the armory. We heard about right. it. Uh, you were anticipating at the last quarterly report. Just wondering how it's is it? You're it's getting, great. Yeah, oh, it is. Great. Um, most of the sales, uh, most of the shows hit about a ninety percent um, sellout uh, on average. Some of the shows start on Thursday, some are on Sunday. So those ones are around sixty percent capacity, and then obviously the Friday and Saturday ones are a sellout, if not around 95%. And so on average, we're sitting around 90. Great. And your capacity is? Two, 243 per show. Tali, could you speak to the ticket price? Because I think we've heard anecdotally that it's a great, affordable family entertainment. We're getting a lot of positive feedback on that. Yeah, most of them, depending on the act, obviously. Um, but most are right around $30. Anywhere from $25 to $32 has been the max so it's far. It's a great price. Thank you. Uh, and then also upcoming, we're really excited. This, you, you guys are seeing it first. MGM Live is going to be our summer concert series this year on the plaza. And so with that will be 25 free and open to the public concerts. And then in addition to that, there'll be some of the ticketed shows that we will do with headlining acts as well. Close to, we're estimating around 10 as we continue to finalize the artists for that. Um, and then in addition to that, you'll see, um, you know, farmer's market, we will continue with yoga, which the community was um, praised significantly. Um, we will do food and beverage festivals. Um, so a lot of upcoming sort of variety that we're hoping um, to have on the plaza for our guests. Great. Any questions for entertainment? Thank you. forgot that this was Mike's section and he, he left, so I guess I'll take over. <laughs> um, 
so I think you know one of the things that um, we wanted to highlight uh, is that you know there are questions around what's going to be our impact to the community, local businesses, and um, you know and while we're we're anxious to see further development, for instance, across the street, uh, so that we can get additional foot traffic. Um, we've seen, we've heard anecdotally and seen as reflected in this article um, that folks within the vicinity, business owners, are really seeing um, a spike in their business. And so this was a piece on NPR um, uh, speaking to that. Um, there is a uh, hotel uh, nearby that we have a strong relationship with um, who has seen um, really some significant increases in their um, occupancy rate since our opening. So you see. 70% occupancy um, with a $95 ADR to now um, a 84% occupancy with a 20% increase in the ADR. So that's that's um, that's a significant um, increase, and, and we hope to continue to see examples like that. Um, one, again, anecdotal that I think many of you have probably seen as you've visited is uh, Red Rose Pizza, who's right next door to us, um, uh, who has been doing a very strong business since we've opened. Um, we we often go in there ourselves and see a lot of our customers with our giveaways eating in there, and we we, we you know we're happy for him. We wish some of them would stay on property, um, but uh, they're doing very well, um, very very well uh, at, at Red Rose. So there has been some really positive um, spinoff impact, and we hope to continue to see that. Um, Residential. Do you want me to cover this, or John, or were you going to tee up the residential, or how, um, Yeah, I, well, we understand it's in the middle of conversation, so if we could have a, I, I know there's sensitivity regarding the the, 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 um, uh, the, the negotiations, but if you could provide a higher level status update of, of what's happening. Sure. Um, if if everyone recalls, we we've um, have a timeline to do our offsite residential development at um, at one point. Um, we were asked by the city of Springfield to, to pause with our own development efforts to try to collaborate with the city on a really iconic um, project in the city of Springfield, right on Court Square, the 31 Elm project. Those discussions have been ongoing for quite some time, um, and and we've we've addressed it several times before the commission. Um, it's it's we've said it's been on the goal line for a long time. It's it's literally inches from the goal line, from what I understand. Um, we've been in several discussions, but we're not privy to all discussions. Uh, I understand that the city has um, requested um, a short um, uh, additional time period uh, for, with respect to our deadline to report to the commission. Really, tomorrow was our deadline to say whether 31 Elm would move forward and we would participate or whether we would go to a plan B um, and, and then what the timeline for that plan B would be. We have. Um, we have been proceeding parallel path and exploring um, a number of Plan Bs and, and have have opportunities, but we are still uh, holding off uh, because we understand there's been some some progress and and this, the city thinks it's um, very close, and so we are continue to be willing to to wait so long as the uh, commission allows us to. Um, and so, but we do feel confident that there's been um, some really significant recent progress. Effort. Yeah, I read the email that we got from uh, Solicitor Piccola. Uh, John, is there anything besides the remarks that he has here in his email that that you can speak to? I'm that not necessarily. It it doesn't mean that it doesn't drive the point that I'm there ask, which I find sufficient. But if there is anything else that you might be able to say, no, I think um, I can just amplify that based on the conversations that I have had. Uh, it does appear that there's very significant activity um, up for consideration today is a vote to extend that 30-day requirement. Um, I can go into a little bit detail about the, what the requirement said, but basically it's is what Seth just reported that um, by March 1st, uh, MGM Springfield shall provide a final commitment and documentation for the 31 Elm Street project along with a realistic construction timetable from the, from the city. And then if it couldn't meet this condition, by March 1st, uh, MGM Springfield shall proceed with independent residential requirement within the time frame, time frame set, um, set in the HCA. So uh, one, one thing that I will note is that um, one of our uh, prior colleagues, Commissioner McHugh, 
often talk to us about the value of, of deadlines and bringing clarity to all situations. And, and I think I will um, you know, recognize this belatedly, that there is tremendous, um, tremendous benefit in having deadlines. But however that said, uh, given the reports that I've heard, I do recommend that the Commission move forward with uh, approving uh, the 30-day extension. Um, this has been an extremely important, the 31 Elm project has been an extremely important project to uh, the City of Springfield. Um, the Commission certainly has shown its diligence in, in following up on the original requirement regarding the 54 residential units. Um, and indeed, it recognized, and uh, commissioners uh, that, that currently are on the Commission recognized uh, that in order to meet the final commitment of construction, we had to know sooner than that that we would either move forward with 31 Elm or move forward to Plan B as soon as we can so that we can get the construction of those units up, up, and, up and running. All that said, um, uh, I do recommend and staff does recommend uh, moving forward with the 30-day um, extension for our deadline. Because you feel like they have made, they're very close to finalizing this, this project. Let me not say uh, very close. I, I would just say that there has been, you know, s significant activity as of late. We've heard very positive things, uh, but just so I don't uh, um, uh, overpromise, um, I, I think I will just stay with that. There's been very significant progress on everything, but um, with that as the wet blanket, let me just say that it does seem very optimistic at this point. Can I ask about the timeline for a Plan B? So that we're giving 30 days theoretically for 31 Elm, or does it also include at the end of the 30 day, it's either 31 Elm or Plan B, or would we, what runway would be needed for Plan B? So um, thank you, Chair. Great question. So um, when we did approve the detailed construction schedule for MGM Springfield, we also did note what that Plan B would be. Uh, currently, there's a requirement under Springfield's host community agreement that those units uh, must be built by March of 2020. And so there was an anticipation that we had to figure out what would happen for that March 2020 date. Uh, I don't think that we're under any misimpression that if the city does choose and the uh, does choose to move forward with 31 Elm, that the construction could be completed by that 2020 date. But uh, there would have to be some additional action at the city level and city council level uh, to uh, determine that date. But I don't think that was uh, necessarily, that was a good explanation, but not necessarily her question. I, I think, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry to put it that bluntly. <laughs> I think you may have been referring to more uh, if plan B starts from scratch the day we move, they move to plan B. And that's not necessarily the case. Am I in the right impression, Seth? That, that's correct. I, I believe that at the, at the end of those 30 days, we would be prepared to um, tell you about what our plan B is, the project, and what our expected timeline would be um, to get that done. Um, we, in, once we're controlling it, in theory, it could be done by that March 2020 deadline. I think um, once we... It's, it's been hard because we're working with um, third parties on that, and they know we're talking about 31 Elm as well. So the, the amount that they're willing to invest in terms of construction drawings, et cetera, while we're waiting to see, it, we've, we've had to be on pause, but we can hit the ground running very fast. I think at the end of this extension, if we feel that 31 Elm is not moving forward, <coughs> we would be prepared to discuss that project, the realistic timeline. And I think it would be, um, I don't think anyone feels that it would uh, take as long as 31 Elm would take, because 31 Elm is a very complicated project that we're not controlling. So mm -hmm. so we could, I think we'd be in striking distance of that original deadline. Right. So mm -hmm. just to provide further fine point on that, um, uh, we were both, I think, saying the same thing, but our original motion held it to that March 2020 date, because that is the date of the, of the, of the under the HCA. Yes. So if indeed there needed to be movement for even plan B, that would require some city action in addition to action by the commission to uh, take a look at that March 2020 date. Agreed. Right. Right. So just so I know, in terms of agenda planning, 30 days from now, we have a meeting. 
what would be our yeah schedule? well while we haven't confirmed our meetings we were on a two-week schedule so 30 days or I would just say um, uh, I think it's 28 yeah March March 20, okay. March 20 yeah Mar I think that okay. March and April have the same day so it That's would right. be March 28 yeah so well, if if need be, if we depending on a motion to, uh, for an extension that's approved, it, I just want to make sure I understand. If 31 Elm Street does not go through, and we ask MGM to come in on March 28th, will you be able to say this is Plan B, and and it will be all prepared to go, or will there still be a need for further? Discussions with another developer, et cetera. No, we anticipate anticipate that we will be able to tell you what Plan B is and and um, our plans for executing on it, executing on it, and the timeline for doing so. Okay. Um, Thank you. I I just want to say, yeah, no, just further uh, comment. Um, I mean, I'm inclined to go along with the request from from the city to extend because this is really a, a request from the city to extend uh, the the deadline. I do recognize the value of deadlines, as you mentioned, as being a big incentive towards people to finally, you know, uh, fish or cut bait, as they say. Uh, but uh, the city really values the prospect of this project, and you will you will see it if you haven't already directly across from from the side of the casino and uh, really on the other side of is it called court square mm -hmm. um, and uh, and what one with a lot of complicating factors for a number of reasons but uh, but really a worthy um, economic development project um, and so we've always had this tension between us over here on MGM trying to meet the requirement uh, that we had put on that has been in place for some time, and the city wanting to try to make this this project work. Um, I don't know that I would feel and, yeah, and much. To be clear, I did understand that this extension right. is driven by the city. I do understand right. that, so thank you. Right. Um, I do think, though, that I, I hope this doesn't turn into another 30 days and another 30 days, and and you know, we find ourselves whatever next year still talking about this. Um, so there's going to have to be some kind of um, really um, reckoning time at some point, if it's not today. But uh, I'm, I'm inclined to go along with the, with the request, as I mentioned. Um, but um, we really hope that the parties are really close to getting it done. I, just just from a, a historical perspective, and I also, you know, um, we don't want this, as Commissioner Zuniga just said, to keep dragging itself out, but um, certainly amenable to the city's request. You know, we're talking about a property that has sat empty for 20 some odd years, right in the heart of downtown, and this seems to be the first kind of real opportunity or credible opportunity that's come forward to try to try to save this historic building. So uh, again, I'm in, I'm in the position of, you know, familiarity with the property of trying to give it this 30-day extension at the request of the city, but also mindful that at some point, you know, the deal is either there or it's not. And, you know, for your ability to, to kind of meet the components of your RFA, too, is to look for another location. But we're holding off on the vote until later in the agenda. Yes. Okay. You just previewed. Well, I see. We well, I didn't gun. know. I didn't know if we were or not. We but, are uh, you could. Well, you could. I, that's here. my question was. It's, we, it's we, slated for later, but if we're oh discussing no. it now, we could take a vote now. If we yeah, we, we started talking about it yes. before it got on the it did. agenda. It did. Agenda, uh, but um, I leave it up to council whether no, we I, can it, move forward. It seems to make sense. You've just had. Mm -hmm. Seems like you've had a robust discussion on it. So, unless there's something that um, you wish to add, or or folks from the commission what wish to add um, other than from MGM well if I believe it's a time it would be a timely motion right now do I hear a motion uh, madam chair I'd move that the Commission approve the request of the city of Springfield for a 30-day extension with respect to uh, 
the development agreement uh, to be finalized uh, with respect to 31L. Second. For the discussion, my only discussion would be uh, we we wish be all parties good luck on this and a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? In, can I just, Aye, for there. clarification purposes, could I assume the 30-day extension uh, times us to the March 28th meeting? It would go to That's April 1st, which would be March 28th, this okay. meeting that precedes That's fine. As That's long fine. as we're within the March 28th. We, what yep. you really expect is an answer by March 28th if we have yes. a meeting that Correct. day. Correct. I think it's important for uh, you know Springfield to understand that because they've asked for this extension. So right. I Thank think you. it's a clarifier. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll touch on the three final points very briefly. Uh, as I know, they're of interest to the commission. Um, the day we, we uh, Chair, we call it the Dave's Furniture lot. I don't know if you've heard this before. It might have been confusing when you first saw it, but that's several years ago, the building that was there, and we've been calling it the Dave's Furniture lot for so long that it's hard to get away, away from. This is the corner of Main and Union Street in Springfield, and uh, it's reflected right there with the Wahlburgers banner. So we have a letter of intent with Wahlburgers to construct a Wahlburgers restaurant um, uh, on that site. We were hopeful that we'd be sitting here today saying that the lease is finalized, but lawyers sometimes draw things out. Um, I'm one of the guilty ones on this particular um, item, but we are very, we had a very productive call the other day, and we, we anticipate no issues with, uh, as soon as we finalize the, um, the detailed lease, we'll move forward with construction drawings, and we'll be able to re report on the time frame. But uh, I believe um, Mike uh, previously mentioned, and it remains the case, that we're, we're hopeful to have a, a New Year's Eve um, opening at, at that um, uh, property, and so that remains the target um, for for the Wahlburgers restaurant. Um, in terms of armory plans, uh, that's one of the requirements that you'd like us to continue to report on, um, our armory development plans, that is. Um, because the uh, Roar Comedy Club, as you've heard, has been such a such a success, and they're extending it, that's we continue to plan to um, utilize it for that purpose for the foreseeable future. Um, but um, one of the things that um, we've experienced, you, you heard Mike talk about the the gaming numbers, our food and beverage uh, numbers have been um, very strong since opening and continue to be. And we think there's a demand that continues to outpace the supply on our, our property. So we continue to look at, and I'll touch on a moment on the next point, we continue to look at food and beverage opportunities. So we're a parallel path, continue to explore and think about whether that armory building um, is suitable for a future use uh, with a multi-level um, food and beverage operation. and. That continues to be an ongoing discussion, um, but um, for the foreseeable future, we continue to use it as the, the comedy club and um, other event programming. Uh, finally, um, I don't have specifics, and, and Mike perhaps would have had a few more to speak to, but we are evaluating our food and beverage needs on site, and there are multiple spaces um, on, our, on our site, um, a, a vacant space between uh, the Western Mass News and um, and TAP. Um, th that's one of the original retail spaces that we've been waiting to develop. We do anticipate um, developing that ourselves as a food and beverage, an additional food and beverage outlet um, over the next several months. Um, we're still working on design, name, uh, and theme, but we anticipate one of the things that Talia wants is rather than have um, portable bars and uh, for the events out there to have the ability to have a restaurant um, with food and beverage there that that has almost a an open air a garage door lift up so you it can service the plaza right there so that would be um, uh, so that's something we're exploring and we're also exploring um, some of the space in the south end market that is um, experiencing less volume whether we can shift the programming and create a standalone restaurant in south end market and we're still determining what the the, again, the theme and food is, but it's possible we'll be adding an additional um, standalone restaurant as part of the uh, South End Market uh, to replace um, the, the wine and cheese bar is one of our performs not at the level of the others, and there's some good space there that we could create a new a new use. So we continue to explore those, and, and with those are additional opportunities for wait staff and servers, and so um, we we continue to push the food and beverage development. Um, and we'll, we'll update.
update you as those plans progress. And unless there are any questions. Just uh, with respect, because you kind of built it in a couple of places under Talia's report and also under the future development. Um, I was always under the impression when we were talking about a, I think it was a 60 day plan to look ahead to how you were programming the plaza and the armory space, which obviously a lot is that, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of that is consumed with roar. Um, I guess I was looking for a plan that might have a little bit more detail, uh, be it a schedule, you know, again, I understand it might be some information you don't want to disclose as to, to who or what, but um, I was always kind of under the impression that there'd be a little more meat to that programming plan. So as we look at them, maybe the next quarterly report kind of building that in, if that's fair. Okay. Do you hear that, Talia? <laughs> yes. Next time, 90-day plan. We will. The, the challenge being our season really out there is going to be Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend. Right. Just right. due to weather. Um, and so we're continuing to look at what that looks like, especially for the 60 days. Um, for the plaza specifically, it will be a little quieter um, and we'll ramp up on May. So uh, next meeting, happy to share what that looks like with you guys. Right. Thank you. And Seth is very glad that Mike had a flight to catch, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, Chair and Commissioners, uh, I'll be brief on the on the very next section. As I mentioned, there are a number of other timelines and deadlines that we are very closely monitoring. Uh, when the Commission approved the MGM schedule, the detailed construction schedule, on April 12, 2018, uh, the Commission established a July 8, 2019 date uh, for the planned construction at the uh, so-called uh, Dave's Furniture Lot that Seth just described. What uh, is that date, John? July 8, 2019. Okay. Uh, so it's clear that deadline will not be met, uh, but as Seth mentioned, significant progress has been made. Uh, so I recommend that the Commission take another look at this deadline in short order um, after evaluating MGM Springfield's construction plans uh, post the signing of that lease. Uh, we'll discuss a date when we can bring it before the Commission, but perhaps as early as that. The 30 days from now, the March 28th date, perhaps we can bring that to you at that point. So we'll discuss that further with MGM Springfield. Uh, in addition to the Dave site, uh, we're also monitoring MGM Springfield's progress on its planned solar installation. Uh, that too uh, has a deadline in the near future uh, pursuant to our Section 61 requirements. Those installations shall be complete within one year of the opening of MGM Springfield facility. Uh, one more item that I'll mention is the completion of MGM's uh, transportation demand management measures that's, that are also required in their Section 61 um, requirements. Uh, you know, due to the uh, time to the time in the afternoon, I think um, if you have any further questions regarding TDM, um, Joe Delaney is here to answer those. But otherwise, we uh, there's significant detail included in your packet. Uh, one item that we'll mention that we're actively working on and MGM is actively working on is an MOU between. Um, MGM and the PVTA regarding a lot of these measures. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, Joe is here. Otherwise, um, uh, there's significant de uh, detail included in the packet. Uh, but we will also need to address uh, that timetable uh, in short order regarding the TDM measures. And so, but both the, but both the solar panel discussion and the TDM could be talked about at a later meeting. Yeah, we have to uh, we have to make it determine exactly what we do because it's a Section 61 requirement regarding TDM. So we'll have further discussions on what yeah. do we do about those measures that uh, necessarily will take a little bit longer in time. Okay. There's 65 items on the on the TDM plan, and most of those, I guess, have been wrapped up or completed. Is there one or two that are really of particular concern, either to our licensee or to you and Joe that? Well, I, I, I think I will just mention the, the MOU. Uh, we've had communications uh, with the PVTA um, and with MGM Springfield about wrapping that up in short order. It does, you know, take a little bit of uh, uh, additional work to put together the MOU, and I know both PVTA and MGM are tremendously uh, busy. Uh, but I know that they're making great they're making great efforts to to communicate regarding all the priorities locally. You know, they obviously work on the loop together. They work on a lot of different initiatives. And we've heard those reports um, uh, in meetings that Joe and I have had with MGM. So uh, we know that they're making a great amount of progress. Um, and hopefully things will be completed fairly fairly soon on that MOU. Agreed, John. And to be clear, we, we have an existing MOU with the PVTA that we 
we negotiated and we went through to develop the loop and, and get that loop service up and running. And so whether we do a separate one or amend our existing one to incorporate the additional commitments is one thing where we've been discussing with them. But it is one of our priorities. And our, our prior relationship entering into the MOU for the loop demonstrates our, our ability to work together and get that done. It's just, um, again, a lot of irons in the fire and taking a little longer than, than we had hoped. But uh, that, is, that is on our priority list. That's great. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I might suggest that while you. we have uh, the MGM folks up here and the uh, Penn folks have been incredibly patient, um, if we could just do the service employee exemption um, quickly. Mm -hmm. I agree with that in case mm -hmm. there are any questions. If, yeah. if right. for, we can for the record, continued patience. For the record, Mr. Mathis promised uh, Lance Aerosmith tickets for letting us go first. <laughs> 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 Sorry. At least four, right? Good afternoon, Manager Curtis. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. How good are you today? Good, good how are you? Thank you? Very good, very good. Today I'm joined with um, Jason Randall, as you know, who's the Director of Human Resources for MGM Springfield. We come before you for approval on service employee exemptions. In your packet, you'll find a memo requesting your consideration for the approval of 15 positions for exemption at MGM Springfield. These 15 positions include 10 unique job profile numbers that represent 67 individuals. The Commission staff has worked collaboratively with MGM Springfield Human Resources Department, and the product of this collaboration has resulted in the positions that we are putting before you for your consideration. Commission staff has recommended these positions be exempt since the positions fall outside of the Commission's endorsed factors for consideration when making exemption determinations. Uh, the only question I had is one position was a manager position that had employees underneath, but you are still recommending that that position, um, that that position, and I'm trying to find the position, is it graphic arts? Would that to... be the creative manager? Yeah, I think it would be. And But there were levels of supervision above it. I just wanted a clarification on that. Yes, Commissioner Cameron, there's, there's five levels of um, supervisory folks above them. Correct. That, that's correct. So you made a determination that although it is a supervisor's position, um, it did not require. Correct. It falls outside of the parameters. Well, one of the, the parameters is managerial responsibilities. Oh, in any department. Yes. Um, but in the past, we've always eliminated a managerial position if there were multiple levels of managers above that position. I don't recall seeing one like this, but it is, you're saying there is precedent here. Yes. Okay. Well, there's also other, other criteria that that would fall under, right? That, that person is not under, on the gaming floor necessarily. Correct. Yeah. But these are all of the factors, so. Right. Usually if it touches any one of them, we don't allow the exclusion, but I think I, we're getting the explanation here. I believe, Commissioner Cameron, there may be additional uh, positions that are similarly supervisory in nature, but there are the levels of oversight, um, as well as the one that you uh, you noticed. Is, is one is the one that I flagged? There yeah, are others. I believe uh, so, and I, yeah, I, I saw that one. I didn't see the others. Well, for instance, uh, transportation supervisor. Warehouse. I think Warehouse. I don't, Warehouse supervisor. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes with me. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I believe you explained to me, Mr. Curtis, that there were additional oversight. Yes. And, and additional levels of supervision in, in multiples, not just one or two. Correct. OK. So you're okay. comfortable there's no risk? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I, I, I would just remind the commission um, you know, that I think uh, one of the factors, I, I, I believe, looking back on the history of this, that the commission also considered in even supporting the legislation for exemption is that the company itself still does a background check. Yeah. They don't necessarily have the automatic disqualifiers we did under the statute, but they are able to look at um, uh, potentially criminal history, 
but it would have to be associated with the type of job that's going on, and they'd make that initial determination. So it's, so this, as just a reminder, these exemptions doesn't mean a person gets hired without any process at all. There is still the company's process. And if I understand correctly, we could reverse any exemption at any time? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the only other clarification I had asked you for earlier was the um, Supervisor Entertainment Events Activation position. And just for everyone else's edification, you did clarify for me that those are all non-gaming floor events, correct? That's correct. No events in that department are run on the gaming floor. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, happy to go along with these requests for exemptions. I uh, I've been uh, in the past uh, among the commissioners that believe that this exemption is a really it really this process uh, uh, really goes a long way towards providing jobs to the underemployed and unemployed, which is a big um, uh, principle in the statute uh, that at the same time also allows us to conform. To the background check and suitability and 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 and, and whatnot licensing rather, uh, in this case of many of the operations that are more critical, those having to do with cash, casino operations, and so on. So, um, for your benefit, we had a long uh, process of arriving to this exemption uh, uh, provision, which we are now voting on a, a few more than what we've done in the past for MGM and PPC, um, and I think uh, it has been really a good compromise. Yes, and I have to thank Mr. Curtis. He's given me a, two very extensive briefings, so I am very comfortable with the process and the framework. At, at this thank point, you. I will still You did have a question, though, an outstanding question on one of the positions? Yes. And I, Mr. Reynolds is going to answer that for you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank Re you so much. Perfect. Related to the uh, food server position that does in-room dining or, or room service, uh, related to service of alcohol that may be brought to the room. Um, the uh, standard operating procedure for that position is to verify identification to ensure uh, any of the recipients of the of the order are 21. So those um, those servers will be checking IDs in, in the room. Okay. Thank you very much. And commissioners, do you have any additional questions? No. Okay. Is there a motion? I'd be happy to move that the commission approve. Um, the request to exempt uh, from um, the following the gaming service employees um, outlined in the packet today from the licensing requirements um, period. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Five zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As everybody settles in, uh, the commissioners will take a five minute break. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, up next, we ask Plain Ridge Park to present its quarterly report representing Plain Ridge Parker Lance George, General Manager, Kim Rigo, Vice President of Human Resources, who uh, unfortunately will be here for her last meeting with us. Uh, we certainly enjoyed all of her visits in the past. Uh, and Mike uh, Mueller, Vice President of Operations. And with that, I turn it over to Lance. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Uh, as, uh, as usual, we'll jump right into it. Uh, 15, 20 minutes is what Commissioner Stebbins committed to. <laughs> as, uh, we will start with uh, revenues and taxes. 
Several numbers on this slide. I'll point to just a couple. A year-over-year -year comparison of the fourth quarter shows a modest uptick in revenue and taxes paid. This increase was largely driven by a stronger than expected December. Notably, Q4 does represent the first full quarter that PPC has faced the impact of two new casino openings in the form of MGM and then closer to home, the new facility in Tiverton, Rhode Island that is just over the border. All in for the fourth quarter, 2018, the combination of taxes paid to the Commonwealth and fees paid to the horsemen at 49% totaled approximately 20 million with gaming revenues just under 40.5 million. Successful quarter, successful year with revenues increasing by roughly 6.8 million from 2017 to 2018. Lottery sales, again, a lot of numbers here. I'll uh, highlight just a couple. Quarter four, 2018, total sales of 867,000, up 5.5% year over year. In total for 2018, sales of 3.6 million, an increase of almost 10%. Encouraging year-over-year -year trend with no material change to the relationship or in the approach. In essence, number of machines remains consistent, as does the location of those machines. No, no significant changes. Transitioning to spending and procurement by states, these next two slides will go hand-in-hand -hand, uh, relating to in-state spending. And so for quarter four, 66% or approximately 1.5 million of the eligible spend occurred in state. The remainder is split amongst several other states. Year end results on the next slide were largely consistent as well with 74% of the eligible spend occurring in state. Purchasing team continues to make spending in mass a priority. Certainly pleased with, uh, with these numbers, no doubt. Digging a little deeper into the property procurement for 2018, we've provided a breakdown of local spending for host community and surrounding communities. Approximately 740,000 of PPC's procurement spend in 2018 occurred in our local and surrounding communities, with the majority occurring in the towns of Plainville and Mansfield. And with that, I will turn it over to Kim. This is her last meeting. I too will miss her greatly. And I think we all wish her well as she heads down to Pittsburgh. Thank you, Lance. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We'll dive into the vendor diversity. So this is a really good story. So we've met and exceeded our goal for each quarter. Um, we had growth in minority business enterprises as well as veteran business. Uh, enterprises. We've had oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Significant growth in women businesses, and that was specifically in Q4 due to uh, food and beverage equipment with Smashburger purchases for the opening of Smashburgers with Kithridge at 172,000. A uh, direct mail with vendor pay payments, um, highlighting Liberty Creative Services for 148,000, um, and we also had marketing promotional goods from global promotional sourcing as well. Heading now into, yep. so continued vendor diversity. So 2018 by quarter, um, each quarter, we were able to meet or exceed our goal, continuing to do that. So women business um, enterprises was for about 13 different vendors at 1.3 million. Minority businesses, there were 11 at 439,000, and veterans, there were eight at 315,000. So Penn is in the process of doing a spend alignment. So where it's accessible, we're looking to retain and continue to move to diverse, diverse suppliers. Next, I'm going to take us through our employment. So our totals each quarter are an as-of date. So though the end of December was at 461, um, this is down slightly and in no way is indicative of a trend. Uh, we do see seasonality with racing and had several layoffs related to racing, but all of those employees will be returning with us in the spring and in March when racing comes back on, on board. Uh, we do currently have, as of this time, 473 employees. Um, our full-time employment, 309, 
67% of our population. Part-time is 152 at 33%. Um, our other numbers remain largely the same. So diversity, um, we typically go up and down one percentage point, so that's at 26%. Veterans uh, remains the same at 5%. A Massachusetts residents were up slightly with 1% higher, so at 65%, and our local continues to trend the same at 34%. Uh, we are very proud of our male and female. Uh, we are 50-50, so we've hit our a new goal, 50% uh, women. And so we have seen, even with the reduction in numbers for the month of December, there was still an increase uh, over Q3 in the number of women that we are employing. That being said, let's move on into Women Leading at Penn, one of my favorite initiatives. Um, so I did want to touch base about the things that we've done in Q1. Q4 was a little flat with the holidays. We didn't have a lot of stuff going on, and we were preparing for these two events in, in Q1 of this year. So we did have um, Ann Nicholson. So Ann is the CEO and president of Simmons Group. She also is a member of the board of Global Gaming Women. So Ann spoke. Uh, enterprise-wide with Penn National. So it was a live recording and then we were able to play it back and it was such a motivational um, opportunity to see her speak that I'm glad that we're able to record it and we have it available so that women can continue to watch it, refer to it. I've even referred back to her slides. Um, so it was very much an empowering session. So she spoke a lot about building your personal brand and communicating assertively. So um, very much respect Ann and, and enjoyed that. We just had um, this week, actually, Ashley Perry. I was glad I was able to, to still be here for, for that as well. Ashley did a, a workshop with us on leadership, courage, and confidence. Uh, she spoke at, I don't know if you remember her, Gail. She spoke, I do. She I spoke do. at the uh, Women's Expo, and so we were able to bring her back and do a small workshop with several women. So it was a very intimate session. So for two hours, and we talked a lot about having tough conversations and giving and receiving feedback. Uh, the team really enjoyed her, and she's also agreed to if people, if if some of the, our team members who are in the group reach out to her to do some continued consulting and one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. So I'm I'm very excited about that. She also is very excited that she's just done a TED talk. So I haven't mm -hmm. watched it yet, but I'm looking forward to to looking at Ashley's TED talk. Great, Kim. Um, question. Yeah. Um, these two programs, the group of women that are being mentored at Penn mm -hmm. to be future leaders, is that the same group you're working with, or is the, are these programs open to others as well? Uh, specifically, the, the group, so that initial 15, and then Michelle and I make 17. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that initial group, but also because we recorded Anne's uh, program, I know several of the women in our group want to share that with, with their teams as well. So there is an opportunity with this one particularly that we are able to share that um, across, the, across the property in different departments with all, all different levels. Um, I did want to mention too that of the 17, there are four that have been promoted in the last year, and there are four mm. that have also had expanded roles. So, mm. so we're, very, we're very excited about that. I, I'm one of them, so I'm, <laughs> Excellent. I'm excited about that too. Yeah. Um, and when we initially started the program, um, we had males in management at 65% and females at 35%. I'm not sure this is largely due to the program, but I am pleased to report that we now have 60% males and 40% women in management so positions. So 5% increase. So 5% increase. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to turn this over to Mike to talk about compliance. Before, Kim, you turn it over, could we oh, just go sure. back to your um, vendor diversity slides? Uh, you said that this is a, a good story. Can you, before you leave, shed light, for my sake perhaps, on how, how you've accomplished these goals? What do you think is the, the greatest driver for you in terms of achieving the diversity? Um, I think largely due to Eli Heward, who is our purchasing manager. Um, Eli has worked very closely with Jill and working to find vendors and resources and meeting with people and going to, I think he went to a, um, well, my world is a career fair, but I know it was a like a like an employee, vendor, vendor fair. fair. Thank you, Jill. Um, and he did a lot of work with um, 
looking at new vendors and opportunities and looking at the types of things that we spend and what other uh, vendors are, are out in, in the local and surrounding community to be able to partner with. Mm -hmm. Director Griffin, does, does, um, has MGM or Plain Ridge worked with uh, the, um, I think it's the Operating Services Division very closely? Um, they have, um, it's still early on, they worked very closely during um, construction um, and the OS&E supplies, and I think they're, um, they're, they're open to working more closely for operations. I have to say that MGM has been very willing um, to talk with vendors. I've referred um, a handful, as has um, Crystal Howard, of um, referred some diverse vendors and or just um, businesses who have expressed interest in doing business with MGM, and uh, we find that these businesses, you know, get a phone call, they get information, and and sometimes get business. So. Good, good. Um, that division that I mentioned, OSD, helps on the certification process and can streamline those processes. And I think that they. Uh, I assume that office might have expos and vendor fairs that maybe MGM hasn't been accessing and maybe Language would want to access, but uh, excellent, yeah. excellent results. Congratulations, and I didn't have the pleasure of working with you, but I do know it's a big promotion, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to join that. I have had the pleasure of working with you, and I, you did a fabulous job with the uh, uh, the women uh, at Penn who lead program and um, promotions are always a great thing, aren't they? So congrats and, and good luck with that. Thank you. I'll I, come back and visit. Okay, great. <laughs> I also want to just congratulate Kim too. I guess I can say she's a star because now she's moving out of our jurisdiction. Um, but she's been wonderful to work with. She has brought, uh, been more than willing to go out and host community college representatives to come to PPC and talk about employment opportunities. We just had a great email the other day from the direct, state director of uh, the Workforce Career Center, Services. Career Services, Alice Sweeney, talking about how helpful and engaging you were. Uh, we hope your successor, and I'm pretty sure your successor will, uh, uh, will have big shoes to fill, but we look forward to working with that person as well. Um, and only because we talked about it with MGM, obviously, we're going to be sitting down with your successor going through some of the kind of uh, reporting requirements that you guys are going to have, again, kind of beyond what's been in the traditional quarterly report, as well as a form that will accurately reflect kind of the new hiring goals that you guys have worked with us on. So we'll be moving that along as well. And you'll be in Pittsburgh. We won't have to worry about it. But we'll miss you. You've done you a great come job. come visit. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, before I start compliance, I will also add that Kim will be greatly missed. She's um, been great to work with these last few years. <laughs> um, looking at our compliance, in Q4, we had about 20,000, just under 20,000 ID checks at our three security podiums. These ID checks prevented 238 patrons from entering the casino. And of those 238 patrons, 10 were minors. 42 were classified as underage, 184 had expired invalid or no IDs, and there were two fake IDs uh, that were turned over to our local GEU agents. In October, we had one underage person gain access to the gaming floor for a total of eight minutes. The person went straight to the player services area where a cashier immediately identified them as underage. Security was called and that person was escorted from the facility. They did not game nor did they consume any alcoholic beverages. Great, great numbers. Thanks. Absolutely. Looking at the next slide, we continue to support our local community in terms of contributions. Uh, shown on the slide is a partial list of our uh, Q4 donations. Looking at YMCA of Attleboro, Parkway Community YMCA, the Ellie Fund, which supports uh, cancer patients while they're undergoing their treatments, Personal Best, which is an organization that helps feed and support local families in southeast Massachusetts the town of Mansfield, and Relay for Life. 
Our Relay for Life goal as a property was $25,000, which we're happy to say we surpassed in 2018. Um, and we have beat our increasing goal every year since 2016 when we started. Our goal for 2019 is now $30,000. For Penn, all of Penn properties who are participating in Relay for Life, over $427,000 was raised to help support the efforts of the American Cancer Society's Relay for Life. Two other events uh, worth mentioning. Uh, we've recently added two donation boxes to our floor uh, for guests to drop their low value Tito tickets in. And those funds once collected will also be going to Relay for Life. So we've had a, uh, a it's been just a few weeks and a great response so far. Uh, and also this past December in our employee dining room, we did a Santa for Seniors program uh, this is where we had a tree set up with ornaments and had suggested gifts for seniors on the ornaments. And our employees picked the ornaments and went out and purchased the gifts. And then those gifts were distributed to local senior centers to provide gifts for some seniors that might not have been able to get gifts for the holidays. Mm -hmm. It was very well received by our, by our team. They did a great job with that. Finally, uh, you can see our winning Wednesdays there, where we donated $777 for every Red Sox regular season win during their 2018 World Championship uh, season. So a lot of money was, uh, was donated this year. Uh, that goes to my next point, because when I looked at the schedule when I was putting this together, uh, Wednesday was a great day to pick, because the Red Sox went 17-6 and six on, Wednesday, on Wednesdays. So. Uh, those 17 wins uh, got another $13,000 towards Relay for Life. That's fund. great. Have we um, have we converted our um, are we converted lands yet? There's there's no chance. Mm. There's, there's no chance. <laughs> it's very hard to live here and not feel the fever. It's hard to live in my house and not feel the fever. <laughs> right. <laughs> great. Uh, you can see on the slide that we've uh, pre uh, the check presenting ceremony uh, for that $13,000 to the Relay for Life. And in summary, our Q4 donations to the surrounding local communities totaled over $62,000. Moving on to the next slide, in Q4 we continue to sponsor lo local organizations like uh, Patriots and Gillette Stadium. And I'll be touching a little bit on that on the next slide. Uh, Nesson, where we have in-game sponsorships with the Red Sox and the Bruins. NBC Sports has their Monday Night Patriots program, which is a radio show that is in our Flutie Sports Bar after every Sunday game. Um, and that is one of the hosts is former Patriot linebacker Rob Ninkovich. And we continue our relationship with Valet at the Rentham Village Premium Outlet Malls, where our patrons can show their players card and receive a loyalty card for the outlet malls to get discounts on their spends there. Final slide, uh, we're going to look at our Q4 marketing highlights. Uh, as I just mentioned, our relationship with Rentham uh, Outlet Malls, we continue to give out our uh, Rentham Outlet and Simon gift card promotions. It's a very popular promotion with our guests, especially in Q4 around the holiday season, as they can take those gift cards and, and spend locally at the Outlet Mall. And on New Year's Eve for our guests, we introduced a new uh, 80s themed party across the entire casino floor where the highlight of that party was having the actual DeLorean from Back to the Future on the floor and the guests were able to, to look at it and there was a representative there that they could ask questions and get their pictures taken with it. It was a very popular event. As I mentioned earlier, we worked with the Super Bowl 53 winning champ New England Patriots <laughs> to offer some exciting experiences to our guests. The first one was uh, a VIP experience where four lucky guests received seats to a uh, Patriots Buffalo Bills game. They also received VIP parking and uh, passes to the Cross Pavilion. The next was a great event uh, called the Patriots Flyaway Experience, where two lucky guests receive tickets to the Patriots Steelers game in Pittsburgh, field passes, ground transportation, and they got to fly back and forth on the Patriots team plane. Wow. Uh, in addition to those great experiences, we also have our season tickets that we offer to our guests uh, on a regular basis. We also work with the Boston Bruins to offer four guests a Bruin, Bruins suite experience, where they receive tickets to the suite at TD Garden for the Columbus Blue Jackets game, uh, dinner, and transportation to and from the game. Our final marketing highlight is one that we're very proud of, 
and you can see the picture up on the screen. We partnered with the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gambling and our local Game Sense office uh, to provide a drop-off point for guests who wanted to support the Holiday Lottery Responsible Gaming Campaign and Toy Drive. As you can see from the photo, it was quite a response from both our employees and our guests, and we were able to provide uh, holiday gifts to uh, many local children that were in need. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well done. You, um, you weathered the competition well. The numbers look really, really strong. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's been interesting. So we were down, you know, publicly reported numbers for uh, mm -hmm. September, October, November. And then December, we were up 10% year mm -hmm. over year. Uh, mm -hmm. January down a bit. Um, and so we'll see what happens as we continue. But it's certainly been a bit of a challenge to understand what that impact is. Uh, I, I would have known more other than December. So right. Just, not, not right. sure, other than weather, certainly was favorable, yes. but uh, certainly a nice rebound in December for us. Great. Thank you. Very good report. Appreciate, appreciate the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, commissioners, next on the agenda is a review of Plain Ridge Park's progress towards meeting its goals and commitments. Uh, included in your packet is a summary memorandum regarding this commitment review and reports and documents provided by Plain Ridge Park regarding these commitments. By way of background, Commission staff and the Commission's Audit Committee uh, have been engaged in a review of Plain Ridge Park's progress in meeting goals and requirements specified in Plain Ridge Park's original application, host and surrounding community agreements, Section 61 findings, its workforce plan, and associated RFA2 workforce requirements. As the Commission is aware, Plain Ridge Park and all the Commission's licensees appear before the Commission uh, quarterly, as today, to report on their pro progress in meeting commitments. Uh, this commitment, the commitment review detailed in the memorandum in your packet, uh, describes a further in-depth review of items discussed at the quarterly briefings and other important matters for review. Uh, as noted in the memorandum, it is clear that Plain Ridge Park has demonstrated success in meeting a significant majority of the goals and stipulations of the original application. Plain Ridge Park will provide a briefing regarding many of these categories of items. In addition, Plain Ridge Park will also detail efforts it has made and is making to meet some of the goals and requirements that it has not yet met. Uh, for example, it will discuss plans regarding the fulfillment of requirements uh, to add a bus connection to Plain Ridge uh, Park. It will also discuss efforts it has made and is making regarding its employment goals and requirements. Uh, in that regard, included in your packet is a draft amendment to Plain Ridge Park's current workforce plan. Uh, both staff and Plain Ridge Park recommend that the Commission update this plan to include new measures to help Plain Ridge Park achieve uh, its employment goals and objectives and also to revise some language that we believe sets unattainable standards. Uh, Workforce Director Jill Griffin and Program Manager Crystal Howard are here to help assist in the conversation regarding Plain Ridge Park's workforce goals. We note uh, that we are not requesting nor recommend that the Commission take any final action on the items before you today. Uh, instead, we recommend that the Commission request Plain Ridge Park uh, to discuss with its hosts and surrounding communities the status of its compliance with its goals particularly the local hiring goals, uh, and we also uh, request that the Commission should ask Plain Ridge Park to meet with uh, GATRA, uh, that'll be descri described by Lance in short order, and MassDOT regarding the proposal to extend the Route 14 bus line to Plain Ridge Park. And finally, uh, we also recommend uh, that we should post the proposed amended workforce plan before taking any final action on any such plan. Uh, so with that as a general background, let me turn it over to uh, Director Jill Griffin, who will provide some opening remarks and then turn it over to the Plain Ridge crew. Um, Chair Judd Stein and Commissioners, um, as mentioned in the memo, we reviewed various categories to ensure that the goals and requirements in the original application and the host and surrounding community agreements 
Section 61 findings and the strategic plan to engage the under and unemployed workforce plan were met. Um, but I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about the process and um, uh, uh, how we got to the amended workforce plan. Um, Director Ziamba, General Counsel Blue, and Construction Project Oversight Manager Joe Delaney, as well as Mary Thurlow um, and Crystal Howard and I began meeting with Lance George and his senior leadership team um, back in September of 2017. And um, we, uh, this morning, reviewed those um, meetings and um, these meetings were um, really vitally important, important, and I think this process really worked. Um, um, Plain Ridge Park um, also met with our executive director and the compliance committee to review uh, their revised um, plan and, and new goals. Um, and I, th I think that um, uh, Lance would agree that we had some very healthy discussions during some of those meetings. Um, I wanted to commend um, Plain Ridge Park uh, for their um, commitment to not only meeting the goals and exceeding the goals, um, but the um, revisions in the plans, they've included some really strong tactics and measures that will um, help them um, to achieve um, especially their workforce hiring goals and, and potentially even exceeding them. Um, so they've proposed an amendment to the workforce plan. Um, they've included enhanced strategies that really may be the factor in creating a successful outcomes for residents in Massachusetts. Um, and these uh, increased um, measures, including, uh, include job fairs on property, an employee referral program. I'm not going to get into the specifics because they'll um, talk a little bit about that. Um, they've established a very strong relationship with career centers and community colleges. Um, and, um, and they already um, talked to you about the Women in Leadership program that focuses on promoting from within. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over um, to Lance George, but um, first I want to recognize also um, Kim Rigo, who's moving on to Pittsburgh, um, and she's a great example of someone who's been promoted to another property. Um, might affect your numbers locally for a little bit, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, congratulations to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will touch on Gatra and public transportation, and then I'll turn it over to Kim to provide some detail on PPC's workforce development plan, as well as an update on salaries and wages, as well as staffing, and discuss how our current status compares to the original RFA2 application. I would say overall we are incredibly pleased as we've taken this opportunity for a look back over the last several months. I think we're in good shape. Uh, as noted in the Commissioner's packet relative to GATRA, PPC has had productive conversations recently. There are a few service options that have been highlighted in GATRA's regional transit plan that would provide service to the Route 1 corridor, which certainly PPC is a part of. Conversations continue and are ongoing. However, progress has been encouraging. As noted in the recommendations, uh, we will provide ongoing updates during our quarterly reports and fully anticipate continued progress. In short, I believe we're in a good place, um, and certainly we look forward to being part of the expansion of the Route 14 bus I don't foresee um, any significant roadblocks at this time, given our recent productive conversations. Lens, can I add, um, just ask, um, I know it's hard to uh, predict the time frame, but anything that, uh, in, in those terms that you might be able to, um, to speak to in terms it, of time frame? As far as completing that initiative? Yeah. Certainly, I think we're optimistic that it's 2019. I know that they would like to move quickly. They had some thoughts. Uh, moving into a, a North Attleboro location in the spring. Um, and as you look at the existing route, um, certainly there is already a drop off in the town of Plainville. And I, I'm oversimplifying it. Certainly that seems simple enough to extend that. There is also a very large development on Route 1 
less than a mile up the street from us that I know they would also like to tap into that has mixed housing as well as retail. So they're open to it. Uh, I believe they see that new development as an opportunity for them as well. Oh. So you're really looking at, I mean, this is great. I, and it, I think it can serve the dual purpose of not only allowing patrons to easily access, access Plain Ridge Park, but you know, to, to Kim's concern, what can this do? Uh, allow residents of the area to access your employment opportunities as well? Personally, I think I'm more optimistic on the employment side than I am on the patron side. I do believe there's opportunity um, because the route is local. Um, so I, I do believe there's opportunity on the employment side for sure. Okay. Great. Salaries and wages and okay. staffing. So there's two things that I'd like to talk about. So the workforce development plan and the RFA2. Um, the updated PPC strategic plan to engage and recruit the diverse under an unemployed workforce population takes into account the changing landscape of workforce development. We discussed in the new plan how the unemployment rate in Massachusetts is significant below the national average and our local and surrounding communities are among the lowest in the state. Penn National and PPC's equal opportunity policy has not, has not changed. We strongly believe in giving equal employment and advancement opportunities to all employees and applicants. In fact, we have raised our initial goal from 10% to 15% of our workforce being comprised of individuals from ethnic minority groups given the success we have had since opening. The goal of maintaining 90% of the workforce coming from the host and surrounding communities has proven to be more difficult due to, among other factors, a significant decrease, like I mentioned, in the unemployment rate. We have, we have made concerted efforts to reach a su sustainable target percentage of workforce from the host and surrounding communities, including numerous job fairs, recruitment bonuses, and other incentive programs. We propose that we shift the local hiring goal to 35% so it aligns with the current workforce environment. We will continue to utilize recruitment tactics tactics to identify and employ residents of the host and surrounding communities. In fact, we would also like to increase additional goals to the plan so that 50% of our workforce will be women, that 2% of more of our workforce will be veterans, and to hire 65% or more of our workforce from the state of Massachusetts. Additional recruitment goals that we've added into the plan include hosting an on-site career fair per calendar year, attending a minimum of one veteran career fair per calendar year in Massachusetts, attend at least two college career fairs per calendar year in Massachusetts, and partner with the Massachusetts Career Centers and coordinate at least two hiring events. And as we've discussed earlier today, we talked about how we had a meeting back in October. Um, we have also had meeting since then with our mass hire um, counterparts and we continue to build our relationship with mass hire we've also uh, happy to be part of now the resource solution initiative and now have a designated mass hire coordinator that will assist us in continuing to partner with mass hire to get out to career fairs and it's much um, easier program now that we're coordinating through through one individual out of the the bristol uh, career center other additions to the plan included developing opportunities with illustrations of career ladders at Plain Ridge for culinary and slot operation positions. We've also included in the plan a Women Leading at Penn program. Lastly, I'd like to discuss the 2013 RFA2. Uh, it included projections in the full competition scenario for number of employees and salary and benefit totals. Our jobs compendium represents 99.6% of the projection. However, there are always going to be open positions. We're happy to report that after comparing the total salaries and benefits from calendar year 2018, the number of employees is at 91% of the total, and the compensation is at 96% of the projection, projected total. We have met or exceeded the projected number of employees in several job classifications. <coughs> specifically in food and beverage, two out of the three subcategories, in other administrative support in one of the four subcategories, and in the engineering, transportation, and valet in two of the three subcategories.
I don't know if this is the appropriate time to ask, but going through um, the attachment in terms of what you'd complied with, um, can you talk to me at all about the, the daycare options? I know it says you don't have the capacity on site. Is there anything other than what's described in here and that you're working on? Are there any specifics about offering daycare options? So we do have a relationship with the daycare center that is two miles down the road. Mm -hmm. And certainly that is the recommendation that we provide to our employees. That is the extent of the relationship at this point. Um, we work with those folks prior to opening to ensure that we would send our employees their direction. But that's it in terms of, because that was in there in the original one. Has there been any further action taken to find additional options or to make that an easier choice for them? There has not at this time. That's certainly something we'll take under advisement and look into further, but there has not at this time. Okay. Does that conclude the presentation? Yep. Yep. Um, now, I know there's no vote uh, necessarily today, um, but is there any other um, yeah, so the, topics that we need to touch on? Uh, so no vote uh, is being requested, but as I, as I noted, we're going to do, we're hoping to do three things. We're going to ask uh, Plain Ridge Park to meet with all of its local communities to go over how it's been doing with all of its commitments. Yep. There's extensive detail regarding how it's uh, been doing in each of the commitments and its surrounding community agreements and host community agreements. Yep. And they can go over some of the local hiring goals, specifically in the workforce plan. Um, in addition, we're requesting Plain Ridge Park to meet with both MassDOT and with GATRA to finalize the uh, bus route alternative plan. Um, and then uh, we want to put uh, up for comment uh, the revised workforce plan and our goal uh, would be that we would bring it back to the Commission in all likelihood by the next quarterly report uh, for Plain Ridge Park so uh, with that uh, we know that the team at Plain Ridge Park has been doing a lot of work over the last year to to take a look at all of their compliance items we of course will continue to take a look at compliance as we go forward um, and indeed in, over the next year um, We'll, we'll take you know, even closer looks. Right. And um, and if I may, I, I um, this was referenced earlier, but um, I have attended the compliance group uh, meetings that uh, take place once a month. And this uh, review, this um, what started as the mid-term uh, review, and is now uh, really the the compliance review for PPC is now uh, a couple of months, a few months um, in the making and have been privy to some of the detailed conversations that have happened and that you have summarized, the team has here has summarized uh, well. Um, and I think it's a great outcome uh, to what leads us at this point. Um, and, and your suggestions, I, th I think, are really right on point as well um, to, um, to really point in the direction of these additional conversations with the host community uh, for the employment goal and GATRA for the transportation goal, and then post those for additional further comments before we take any Great. any other Thank action. You. Any further questions? No. Thank you for your presentation today. Uh, thank you, Ombudsman Ziamba and Director Griffin. Very, very helpful. In terms of uh, the one question I did have, when will we be reviewing the workforce number? Uh, is there a date on that? Or so our anticipation would be at the next quarterly report with Plain Ridge Park, okay. which we haven't quarterly scheduled report. that date, but uh, quarter, likely the next quarter. two Thank plus you. months away. Uh, if we do see a need, we could always bring the workforce plan to the commission earlier than that, but uh, perhaps I think that would be a good timetable. Well, thank you, and, and, and good luck to everyone, but particularly to you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Good luck in Pittsburgh. Thank you. And drive home carefully. I think we can move to item six, commissioner's updates. Do we have any? I have one update, um, and that is that we have been officially selected by the uh, board of directors for the International Association of Gaming Regulators to host the 2020 conference here in Boston. We would be the host agency. 
And, um, you know, typically it's 250 to 300 regulators from around the world, very interesting group, and um, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for our commission to do. Um, some of us have been active members with this uh, association, and um, we just received word this week uh, that we have been selected to do that. So just wanted most of you great, knew that. Yeah, great, great news. It's um, usually when September is, when is or October is of, when they have it. They wait for another conference. They uh, they wait for the dates to be posted for um, the Las Vegas uh, conference G with G2E, G2 e, which is usually the end of September. So we will we're in the process of working with the board. Janice, of course, has. Um, as she always does, uh, you know, volunteered to really um, spearhead our effort on behalf of the commission. We'll be, but we will be looking for volunteers to assist. And um, so you, uh, we'll get the date shortly and um, work on all the other logistics with the, with the association. But it's in 2020, right? It's in Not 2020, in correct. In 2020. Yes. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a conference that I know, I know you've attended. I have. Um, in the past, something yes. that I've been, uh, you know, yes, very and I know in the past, and I think it's very. Our fellow regulators are looking forward to coming right. to Boston, right. especially those from uh, outside the United States. Right. Exciting news for us. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Any other reports from commissioners? Yeah, I have uh, one. It's a little bit of a um, um, preview of what's to come in in, in the next month. But uh, March is a problem gambling awareness month. Um, March begins tomorrow, uh, and um, there are a lot of efforts that go, um, that are visible, and a lot of efforts that are behind the scenes relative to a lot of um, awareness, education, and prevention. We will be hearing from uh, Vander, uh, Director Vanderlinden and others, uh, hopefully during the next couple of meetings. Uh, on some of the details of what uh, takes place in, in now two properties, uh, in MGM and, and, and PPC. And a lot of those efforts, just to summarize, summarize them very briefly, um, include education and, uh, and prevention work with casino employees, who happen to be a group that is at slightly higher risk of um, having uh, developing a, a, a problem gambling. Um, and so um, our Game Sense program is very much a hands-on uh, program in that effect as well, something that is not quite visible to, uh, to the public, but it's important for us to, uh, to understand and appreciate. And we will have, uh, again, a lot of more of those updates in the coming uh, commission meetings. Nothing from me. Well, item seven is reserved for any matters not reasonably anticipated at this time of posting by the chair. Uh, having none, I have a motion to re adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero. Thank you. Thank you.